Most college football media and fans across the nation when talking about Florida football focused on that brutal schedule and what might be the fate of Billy Napier and all of that big picture business. But there's work to be done day to day. And of course, we're going to see the culmination of that uh, spring work uh, in the swamp on Saturday. We got David Waters here, of course, from Gators Breakdown, the best in Florida football coverage. David, how you doing? Good, Mark. Uh, you know, coming up on the final days final few practices for uh spring practice for the gators so i've uh, been uh i won't say too eventful this spring but uh, certainly glad to have some football to talk about even though you know somewhat limited access but uh hey what else what else you go do in march and april <laughs> and, and steering everyone away from the okay whatever we say on saturday that's those are the players that are stepping up or those are the players that are struggling. It's one of 15 sessions. It's the one that everybody gets to see. So that's the importance is that people get to see it, but it's no different uh, in terms of an evaluation of this team. So once you get to see what happens on Saturday and put that together with everything else that's happened uh, in the last couple of weeks, um, you know, what are your basic impressions of what this Florida team has been able to uh improve on in the last month uh, mark i'll give you probably one storyline for each side of the ball um there's been a heavy focus on gators breakdown the last couple of days of in coming out of that second scrimmage from last saturday as well florida in that offense graham mertz at quarterback a big time focus on pushing the ball down the field uh graham mertz coming from wisconsin and priority number one coming from wisconsin was take care of the football uh, and he did that. You know, he had a big bounce back, and I mean, he turned the ball over. I forget the number, and in 2022 at Wisconsin, but it was an astronomical amount. And it was like, oh no, you know, Florida just went from Anthony Richardson who turned the ball over to a quarterback who had turned the ball over at Big Ten and Wisconsin. You know, can Billy Napier work some magic there? And there, look, there was some magic there. Graham Mertz really improved um, his his you know the, the his ability to turn the ball over. It, it, it completely flipped the script. Uh, so now for him, it's okay. Now, as Billy Napier likes to say it, now it's time to take this calculated risk. You know, great, Graham Mertz was around 70% completion percentage, but a lot of that was due to, all right, checking down, not taking a whole lot of risk down the field. Well, now it's, all right, let's take the next step in this offense. You made improvement last year. We saw you take away those turnovers, but now let's push the ball down the field a bit more. And that's been a big-time focus all offseason in spring practice uh, of, of that being the next step in this Florida offense. Trey Wilson returns at running back, uh, I mean, at wide receiver. And then, of course, uh, Billy Napier has lauded the two tackles they brought into the transfer portal uh, Brendan Crenshaw Dixon from San Diego State, Devin Manuel from Arkansas as true tackles. You know, he says Florida didn't play with true tackles uh, last year. They had some guys out of place hit the transfer portal. So protection should be better for Graham Mertz as well. It wasn't all Graham Mertz last year of why Florida could push the ball down the field. Uh, Mark, anytime Florida would almost play action pass or a deep drop, there was a lot of pressure in Graham Mertz's face. So protection uh, up front. Uh, Graham Mertz taking more chances and then relying on a weapon like Trey Wilson at wide receiver uh, should go a long way in, in Florida uh, it, getting that explosion in the offense. And then on the other side, Mark, it's been lauded and, and hopefully something that comes to fruition uh, in, in the fall would be much better safety play. And I just mentioned the transfers all along the offensive line for Florida, but Florida hit the transfer market heavy for the safety position as well. Brought in Ace Turner from Washington, uh, and then DJ Douglas from Tulane, Triquez Bridges from Oregon to create some competition with Jordan Castell, who was all SEC freshman last year, and Bryce Thornton, who got a lot of freshman play in time last year at the safety spot as well. So Florida needed experience to help push those guys. And DJ Douglas and Ace, Ace Turner have been probably names I have heard the most out of any players this spring as far as improvement goes, a position group that Florida needed help at the safety spot, and those guys have shown in, shown up, practice in, and practice out. So um, creating turnovers, great in coverage, and number one, Mark, tackling. I mean, <laughs> Florida's been a dreadful tackling team uh, the last few years. That continued uh, in Billy Napier's second year last year. So this time of year, you're going to hear some good things, uh, but probably the most positive aspect I'm hearing so far is much better safety play because of what Florida has done in the transfer portal. David, back to Mertz. Uh, based on what I'm hearing, uh, he's showing a little bit more just comfort, even off the field, uh, that he's the guy – 
he's been on campus now. He understands. He knows his teammates, knows what's expected of him. He just is just a more comfortable person now that he's been in Gainesville for over a year. Absolutely, Mark. I mean, a year ago, he was learning the offense. I mean, spring was him taking his first snaps in Billy Napier's offense, and now that familiarity is there. Uh, so now, look, he's even got the, a chance now to teach it. You know, DJ Lagway, the five-star freshman, is right behind him. And I think there's some probably there's probably some some positivity to go along with that, too, and trying to teach somebody else the offense, what you like about the offense. And, uh, and now, Mark, given that he's been in college football for so long as well, with this experience in Billy Napier's offense, I mean, now he knows so much of the offense, he's helping make the game plan. He's helping, okay, this is what I like. This is what I don't like. Let's build on the things I do like in this offense and see if we can take that next step. Russ Calloway has been promoted to a co-offensive coordinator there with Billy Napier, so uh, you get some more of the air raid emphasis in the, in, in, from his background input into this offense as well. So you know, there's some things uh, that, that are changing, Mark, but I, I do think just the experience of having Graham Mertz back in this offense. I mean, we got to remember, this is Billy Napier's third year. This is the first time he's had a returning quarterback uh, at Florida. So that should go a long way as well in, in this offense, hopefully taking those next steps uh, for Billy Napier because, Mark, the, the offense has been serviceable, no doubt. I mean, it's been the better side of the ball <laughs> by far uh, in Billy Napier's tenure. But there is a step in consistency. There is a step in big play explosion that they're looking for this spring. David Waters, Gators Breakdown. Uh, head on over there. Check out David's work. If you're not aware, you should be. Even if you're not a Florida fan and following the SEC, get on over to Gators Breakdown. It's right here on YouTube, also GatorsBreakdown.com and your favorite audio platform as well. And you mentioned the transfer portal, some of the help along the offensive line. If you look at the sheer numbers, they lose 22 players. They gain 11. That looks like a negative, but obviously it's a numbers game in regards to scholarships and so forth. Uh, how do you think they stand in regards to the additions and subtractions through the transfer portal and what they might want to do starting next Monday when, again, we're going to have another transfer portal cycle headed our way? Uh, yeah, so we'll go transfer portal and at the wide receiver spot, they bring in Chimray DK, who played with Graham Mertz a couple years ago at Wisconsin. So there's familiarity there as well as we're talking about this passing game explosion. Uh, there's a there, there's a relationship that, that's already been built there. Mark, I still think Florida may go try at, at another receiver. Uh, and, it may, and also, I think when spring practice is over, uh, that might be a position Florida may lose a player or two as well. There's some veterans who haven't quite broken through in, in their career at Florida. They may decide to go go somewhere else and play so uh, i think florida would probably like to add another anyway uh but it may be forced to because of numbers if they do lose one or two wide receivers when spring uh is over uh florida hit the transfer portal on the defensive line as well bringing in joey slackman uh one of the top you know defensive linemen in the transfer portal last cycle uh, or you know in that in that uh, winter cycle one of the top defensive linemen um, in, in the transfer portal. Uh, but I still think Florida could use one at edge rusher as well. They have a very young player in TJ Searcy who's in his second year, um, thought to be probably the main target there uh, to take over for Princeton Human uh, to, to, to at that edge spot to create pressure on the quarterback. But I think Florida could probably use some experience there at, at the same time there, Mark. So um, did hit the transfer portal with George Gums, but – very, he transferred from uh, Miami of Ohio, if I remember off the top of my head right, only played one year of defense uh, last year. So just not a lot of experience at that edge spot for Florida. So that's another position I do think they could attack in the transfer portal. That'd be my probably top two. May maybe another interior offensive lineman. Uh, as I said, they hit the transfer portal for two tackles. If push came to shove, maybe another interior offensive lineman, but wide receiver edge rusher, maybe tight end as well is where Florida could go transfer portal hunting and when it opens up next week. So if nothing drastically changes before August, where are the biggest position battles? Ooh, I'll go safety again uh, because I said that there were some young players in Jordan Castell and Bryce Thornton who played a lot last year and they brought in some experienced guys in the transfer portal. So I do think it's a big benefit for Florida, Mark, to create a whole lot of competition in that room. I think who comes out of those battles uh, will be a big, big plus for Florida. Linebacker, uh, I mentioned edge rusher, so, but it's kind of how I explained it. It's just so young, uh, an edge rusher. TJ Searcy is is the guy, but maybe behind him uh, some battles. But I'll go with the linebacker. There's Shamar James, the incumbent, not doing too much in spring this year as he recovers from an injury. 
bring in Pup Howard from South Carolina, right up the road in Jacksonville. Uh, Florida missed out the first time. He spent a year in South Carolina. Year two, he's now at Florida. He will probably, to me, end up being the guy besides Shamar James, but he's in a battle with Jaden Robinson. Um, some other guys, Manny Nunnery, uh, has been limited this spring a bit too, maybe backing up Shamar James. Uh, but I like that competition. Uh, they're at, at the linebacker spot. And then uh, probably the running back behind Montrell Johnson. He's for sure the number one running back. Trevor Etienne on his way to Georgia. Trayon Webb in his second year. Florida brought in a couple of true freshmen they're really excited about uh, it, for, for at, at, in this running back room. So uh, I do think running back behind Montrell Johnson – could be a pretty interesting battle as well. How is the 2025 uh, recruiting cycle coming along at this point? Uh, a yeah, pretty good, Mark. Um, it, it's um, it's going to be weird, kind of, to seeing how it all shakes out. Florida's, you know, in some battles. They get they got some names uh, there, Mark. But I do think it, it's probably going to be a lot of wait and see mode for how Florida performs in this season. You know, they had that big summer rush last year. They got up to number three in the recruiting rankings. The season didn't go as well as, as they had hoped and you know, certainly had a falter down the stretch. So um, yeah, I'll pull it up. I'm trying to – I think it's five commits, four or five commits right now um, off the top of my head. Let me see. Um, pretty quick. So, yeah, five commits right now led by Jalen Wiggins, one of the top – defensive uh, lineman in the, in the country uh, got w- went to the state of Georgia and got Peyton Joseph an interior offensive lineman offensive line recruiting has not been the best since Billy Napier has taken over uh, definitely known for their development of lower rated prospects but recruiting starting at a high level in that room would certainly be a, a big boon for this th- this program to get that position group changed around uh, but sitting at five commits right now Mark about two one top 100 prospects as it sits right now uh, so a lot of visits over the last few weeks. There'll be some at the spring game as well. Uh, hopefully that can set the stage for some kind of big summer at Florida. Uh, again, they definitely won't have that big push they had last summer. Mark. There's just no way with the situation this program is in right now, whether it's true or not, whether it's fair or not, that you know the talk of Billy Napier being on the hot seat, but that's certainly going to come across in recruiting battles from from rival coaches. You know that's going to be brought up. Uh, so I, I think it's going to be a little bit slower summer than it was last year, more of a wait-and-see approach uh, and see if Florida can have a big finish compared to what they did last year. David, I've spent many an off-season day ranking schedules and building spreadsheets and making all sorts of comparisons and trying to figure out, okay, they may have the – the toughest they may have the second tough and and it's a it's a usually a very close call trying to figure out for the entire power five this offseason slam dunk no <laughs> doubt it's florida i don't even have to look at it past that um it's it's incredible and you probably have talked about it at nauseum the final five games are ridiculous so is there this thought that among the fan base that come on how are we going to get through this season and have whatever we could term a successful season? This could be, if this team goes seven and five, they better be ranked like in the top 20 in the country. <laughs> Seriously. They, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. You get seven wins. There will be good wins on, on, on that schedule. I mean, that's how tough the schedule is. Sanford is the only for sure. Write it in a marker win. I mean, look, uh, yeah. Mississippi state in, in year one, of Jeff Levy, yeah, that should be a win. But Billy Napier's had trouble on the road since he's been head coach at Florida. I mean, there's been there's no for sure there's been no for sure wins when you've dealt with Billy Napier at Florida so far. Losing to Vanderbilt in year one, losing to Arkansas uh, last year as well. You know, games that should have been wins for Florida did not appear to be wins when 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 the uh, or did were not wins when, when the final gun exploded. So yeah, Mark, it's it, it's very tough, and it starts week one with Miami. Um, UCF comes to town as well. Texas A&M when Mike Elko comes to town. And then you mentioned that final five game stretch. Uh, it, it is, it is tough. I mean, Kentucky is not a for sure win or for any more for Florida um, play them before a bye week and then Georgia. So, I mean, Mark, I mean, the, I mean, the, the final seven games, Tennessee, Kentucky, Georgia, Texas, LSU, Ole Miss, Florida state. I mean, it's, it is brutal. Um, but I've, I've maintained the fact, Mark, if this thing is headed in the right direction, no matter how, how, how hard the schedule is, we should know. I mean, 
There's enough talent on the roster not to compete for championships. Nobody's expecting Florida to compete for championships, but there's enough talent on this roster. If it's headed in the right direction, you'll know. There should be a couple of upset wins. You should win the games you're supposed to win. We should, by the time Florida, Florida State rolls around in late November, we should know the that the direction of this program, if it's headed in the right direction under Billy Napier, no matter how hard a schedule is. And you probably know better than I do that uh, week one showdown against Miami. That's a home game. That's a huge advantage, obviously, but those Miami fans are counting that up as a win. Like it's, it's nothing. And these are two teams and two programs trying to find themselves. So that could really push one of them in a good direction. And then the other one, not so much. Yeah, I mean, there's another program right now that can say there's no for sure wins on the schedule. Miami is in that boat as well, <laughs> given the games that they have lost, how they've lost games the last couple of years uh, under Mario Cristobal. Look, that, that is a that's a high-stakes game. Uh, both coaches had in their third year. Both coaches looking for some momentum uh, in their programs. Uh, Mark, I think you know for that side of Miami that you just explained, if you go to the Florida side of it, I've mentioned the unexplainable – Losses that Billy Napier has had in his tenure so far, where there's been some unexplainable wins early season for Billy Napier the last couple of years as well. Getting that game opening win versus Utah, getting that first big home game win last year versus Tennessee. So there's been those big at home wins that Billy Napier has been able to provide the last couple of years. Miami seems to be in that boat as well. So you know that would be you know, beneficial for Florida to, to play like that again, but to create some momentum. If there's one word that has really done Billy Napier in so far in his tenure at Florida, it's been momentum. Like I said, you had that win versus Utah last year or in, in year one, only to follow it up the week later by you know just completely no-show versus Kentucky. And then last year, you beat Tennessee at, at, at home only to – you know, falter just just a couple of weeks later again against Kentucky again. You know, so thankfully maybe Kentucky's not early in the season to derail Florida's early season momentum. And that game's later in the season, but just not being able, going back to recruiting. You had that number three recruiting class last year, not being able to keep that up. So momentum has not been friendly to Billy Napier, but you got to start somewhere to build momentum, and no better place than getting that game one win against Miami. Another A-Day game is headed our way from Tuscaloosa on Saturday. This one, of course, the first one since 2006 without one Nick Saban and his pink suit at Brian Denny Stadium. We got Stephen M. Smith of Touchdown Alabama and, of course, the show that you need to lock in on every Monday, Wednesday, Friday. In my own words with Stephen M. Smith, 630 Central. Stephen, how are you doing today? Doing great, Mark. We got a big weekend right here, A-Day weekend for your Crimson Tide going to be Saturday, 3 p.m. Central Time from Brian Denny. You got ESPN. This matchup, the first one in the Kalen DeBoer era. Just so much excitement. Whether it was Nick Saban in the lemon suit or Nick Saban in the uh, evening baby blue blazer suit, uh, whatever suit Nick Saban chose to have on for a day, it was always a fast statement. But like you mentioned, Mark, for the first time since 06, it will not be Nick Saban. Brand new man, so we'll have to see what the fashion selection of Kanglin DeBoer will be. But a lot of the fans excited for the new era here of Alabama football starting off in the spring game. And so this first edition of uh, Kalen DeBoer's team, of course, uh, gets to see the public and the public gets to see them for the first time. I know that offensive line is a key spot that you're going to be reviewing. And what are you looking out for there? Uh, definitely the offensive tackle position, Mark. The, the interior play has been strong all spring. When you look at uh, Tyler Bucker at left guard, uh, right guard, Jaden Roberts at that center position, James Brockermeyer, the former four-star in the 2021 class from Fort Worth, Texas, has won uh, that job at that center position. So your interior seems to be fine. The outside guys, your two tackles, that's the position that my eyes will be on. At that right tackle spot, Will conform be the former four-star in the 2023 class from Northridge High School here in Tuscaloosa has seemed to really emerge at that right tackle position, taking that spot. But we departed J.C. Latham, who's headed to the NFL draft here upcoming on that, in the latter portion of this month. And then at left tackle, you got Elijah Pritchett, somebody who has experience playing an offensive tackle. He's been getting work at that spot with the first team uh, throughout the spring. So Elijah Pritchett 
and will conform be two eyes, two people I will keep my eyes on in the A day game to see how they work there at both tackle spots. Stephen, if only we knew what was going through the mind of one Caden Proctor right now. So, of course, uh, transferring back home to Iowa uh, after the Rose Bowl game within a few weeks after that, and now supposedly headed back to Alabama. So that is the understanding of most is that he is headed back to the Crimson Tide. Now, the, uh, the portal opens back up next Monday and we shall see what he truly follows through on. That's the biggest speculation right now, Mark, is what happens with Caden Proctor. Uh, came as a five-star from Iowa to Alabama in the 2023 class. Went through some struggles early on in left tackle, but he grew throughout the season, got better throughout the year, helped this program win an SEC championship and what would become Nick Saban's final season, uh, uh, helped the team get a berth in the college football playoff, uh, got him to that Rose Bowl there against Michigan, despite the disappointing 20-27 to 27 overtime loss. Of course, when Nick Saban announced his decision to retire on January 10th, that shocked everybody. Caden Proctor, uh, 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 like a lot of people, you know, decide, decided, hey, will this place be the same uh, without Coach Saban? Let me test the waters, go elsewhere to find a different home in college football. So he goes back home to Iowa, which to, to I mean, nobody really disappointed by that because Nick Saban retiring, you can see where emotions would lead for you to, to go elsewhere. So Caden Proctor goes back home, uh, kind of started to figure out that maybe home is not where I need to be here at this time. And you got the speculation that came out of he wants to come back to Alabama. He wants to return to Tuscaloosa. He wants to enter his name in the transfer portal to come back. So you had all of that noise going out there. But right now, Proctor has not put his name in the portal. As you mentioned, Mark, the portal reopens back up April 15th, next Monday, two days after the spring game. And all eyes will be on that to see if Mr. Proctor holds true on the speculation and enters his name into the portal to make that move to potentially come back to Tuscaloosa. If he does so, then you look at that left tackle position, there's a battle there again between Elijah Pritchett and Caden Proctor. If Proctor chooses to not return to Alabama, then Pritchett hones in on that spot there at left tackle. So the speculation will take an all-time high next Monday as we wait to see, does Mr. Proctor hold true on that statement or on the speculation of re-entering back into the portal and possibly returning to the Crimson Tide. Folks, please subscribe to our SEC channel and please give us a like if you enjoy the content. Get on over to Stephen's show. It's every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday right here on YouTube, 6.30 Central. It, it's the time and the place to be again right here on YouTube in my own words with Steven. Steven, as you survey the rest of the offense and even uh, to the other side of the line of scrimmage on defense, what are the other position battles that, and, and just to reiterate to people and underline this, because so much focus is put on the, the spring games that like this is like a real game or something. This is one of 15 sessions. The only thing that makes it special is people are able to see it, but it's not... <laughs> Yes, uh, anything absolutely. past that so, evaluation. Yep. The, the, the A-Day the a game, people, is a formality. This is a time for the fans to catch up with old friends, old colleagues, old family members, and just take in a, a uh, to, to take in a full body of 15 practices of work. This does not mean that if this person goes off, dominates the A-Day game, that they are the concrete starter. It does not mean that. It does not mean that if somebody has a terrible A-Day game, oh my goodness, they are god-awful. It does not mean that. This is just one practice of 15 sessions of an entire body of work. So this is still a part of the evaluation period. Now, where it matters is when fall camp comes in, and that's two to three months down the road. When we get into August practice, that's where it begins to matter. That's where it begins to you start to see the guys that become the starters or become the marquee contributors in the rotation. So spring football, it's a formality. Payment value, fall camp is where it really truly matters. 
That said, Stephen, what other positions besides offensive line will pique your interest on Saturday, both sides of the football? Well, first and foremost, uh, the wide receiver position will definitely pique my interest just due to you haven't had that wide receiver room to just be dominant since the room of Jerry Judy, Devontae Smith, Henry Ruggs, uh, Jalen Waddle, John Mechie, that group from tw- that group in 2019. You know, that, that, that was a very elite group right there. So you haven't had one since that group. But you look at you know, Kobe Prentice in this group, uh, Kendrick Law in this group, Emmanuel Henderson in this group. You got Jeremy Bernard, the transfer from Washington in this group. You've recently moved a king of Odom from tight end to wide receiver. So now he's in this group. Of course, Jalen Hale, we hate that he went down with a significant knee injury in the spring ball. And hopefully Alabama will be able to get him back for fall camp. And most importantly, the upcoming season here. But you have a talented wide receiver room. But who becomes the number one guy? And I'm looking forward to seeing that in the A-Day game. Who can make those plays that a number one receiver makes? And so far, Kobe Prentice has been the star throughout spring. When you look at the routes that he has, uh, the dependable hands that he's got, the speed, he's always been that burner type of receiver coming from Camara High School in the 2022 class. So uh, Kobe Prentice has a lot to show. Kendrick Law has a lot to show. Emmanuel Henderson has a lot to show. So for me, it's going to be in that wide receiver room offensively who emerges as that number one guy. Defensively, my eyeballs will be on the defensive line. There is so much talent on this group up front, but rotation-wise, Mark, who can make some noise break into that rotation? We know the older guys, your Jaheim Otis's, your Jamarian Latham's, your Tim Smith's, Tim Keenan's. We know those guys. When you talk about Damon Payne, Curtis Perry, James Smith, Keon Keeley, Jordan Renard, Steve Mboa, who came in this recent class here, Isaiah Faga, uh, Jeremiah Beeman, of these young kids who can break that rotation and get some marquee playing time coming into the upcoming fall. So this defensive line and turning those big men loose to create havoc to the quarterback as well as stop the run because going into a 4-2-5 swarm under Coach Kane Womack, a lot of things are going to be put on that four-man front. And can that four-man front create big-time havoc? Uh, my eyes will be on the defensive line. And, of course, Stephen, uh, Will Reichard's old spot is up for grabs as well. It is. The kicking job's up for grabs. right? And it's crazy, Mark, but think about that. After five years of just pure consistency from Will Reichard, you knew when the ball came off his foot it was going to go uh, through the goalpost there. And so the all-time leader for points – in NCAA history, headed off the NFL draft. So many pro teams will be looking to see which one can call his name off the board here the latter portion of this month. But you've got Connor Talty and Upton Belafon competing here for the job to fill in the void left behind by Riker. Uh, both guys had a great scrimmage on yesterday, uh, not, not yesterday, Saturday over the weekend, making several kicks out there for the Crimson Tide. But this A-Day game will be the first time where fans will get a look to see the kicker position. Both guys extremely talented. Tall T came into that 2023 class, one of the top guys in terms of the Coles kicking campsite, the Chris Saylor kicking campsite. So going to be fun to get our eyes there on that position. Me personally, I think Connor Talty will take it just due to the, the amount of time he spent around Riker this past season. But it's going to be fun to watch these two, Belafonte and Talty, which one can take over that mantle left behind by Riker. Folks, please subscribe to our SEC channel in particular, like the video, and of course, get on over to In My Own Words every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 6.30 Central right here on YouTube with Steven. And most importantly, Steven, are you going to get fed? That's the big thing here. That's the most important thing. Now, I've been looking into a bit of the food menus. I think DeBoer's got it right here. I think DeBoer's got it right. So when I walk in there, hopefully I'm not being tricked. It's a good meal, but I think DeBoer's got it right. (laughs) Okay. We'll be uh, 
awaiting that report back on that, Stephen. Absolutely. In the meantime, sir, we're also looking forward to 2025. Alabama's got eight hard commits, the last three to come in the door here. Daryl Johnson, Eastman, Georgia, fifth-rated linebacker in the country, top 50-rated player, all-region. Uh, Abdul Sanders out of Santa Ana, California. He's a linebacker, top 36 at his position, according to 247 Sports. And Luke Metz out of Mill Creek, Georgia, as another linebacker. I'm going to say this. Tane Womack wants hard-hitting backers. He wants that to play in the sport 2 5 scheme. He wants linebackers that can dissect, that can fly around, that can sniff it out, that can shoot the gap, and that can lay the wood. That's what he wants. He wants toughness. He wants smarts. He wants physicality. And he wants it in spades in all three of those areas. And he's getting that with all three of these kids, especially Luke Metz. Luke Metz coming from a Mill Creek High School that produced Caleb Odom, that, not Caleb, uh, Caleb Downs, excuse me, produced Caleb Downs. Mill Creek's got dudes. And to get Luke Metz, somebody of whom he does do a lot of talking, he's about action. And to get a guy that's about action, this is what Kane Womack wants on the field. When you hear this, this, this man talk, being a head coach at South Alabama, now a D.C. at the University of Alabama, his dad, Dave Womack, one of the originators of the 425. I mean, uh, th this was a hire that Alabama needed to have in. When you talk about his vibe, uh, he kind of gives you that Kirby Smart, Jeremy Pruitt type of vibe to him. And if that means anything, that means his Alabama defense is going to be playing with its hair on absolute fire, making plays, which has done that all spring long. So to get three linebackers committed, to get three linebackers that Kane Womack has spent a lot of time studying tape on, and to get three guys that can lay the number and that can dissect it down. This is huge here for Alabama football. And it's showing that even after Nick Saban, Bama's got a coaching staff that can flat out recruit because this was the worry that a lot of fans had going into the Kangan DeBoer era is could Kangan DeBoer recruit? Could his staff recruit? This is showing you that his guys are getting out there and they're hitting the pavement. And again, Johnson, all region with 103 tackles. Sanders had 48 tackles and a pick with eight uh, tackles for loss. And then your guy, Luke Metz, with 51 tackles, five sacks, and a pick as well. Steven, enjoy a day. All right, folks, who you got on Saturday? The orange, the white. I'm guessing if you're a true Tennessee fan, you've got the let's stay healthy, no injuries. That's who you really got on Saturday. Let's uh, do that. Uh, we got uh, Chase Thomas here from the Chase Thomas podcast. Always appreciate Chase stopping by. Chase, it's been a while. Good to see you, man. Good to see you, too. Yeah, it's a busy week here in Knoxville. we got Tennessee LSU this weekend um, in Knoxville. We've got a new Lady Vols basketball coach introduced this week uh, coming in from Marshall. We've got uh, the Orange and White game, as you talked about, on Saturday. So it's going to be it's a busy time here uh, at Everything School HQ. Another thing to remind people is that, uh, you know, the, the TV cameras are on and that makes the spring game a big deal. However, it's just one of 15 sessions to the coaches, to the players, to those guys that line up every day in practice. They just think of it as, okay, this is just another scrimmage. We've got other scrimmages. This just happens to be the one that people can see. So that in mind, not just taking what you want to see on Saturday, but basically the intel of Tennessee spring practice up until this point and then going through the spring game. You know, where are those key areas? Let's start with the offense in regards to position battles and what you want to see. I think for me, I mean, obviously all eyes are going to be on Nico as he he flashed last year. He had a really big play down the right-hand side that a lot of folks were really excited about where he was, it was an off-platform throw. Um, he found Ethan Davis um, down the right-hand side who is slated to play a big role uh, former four-star tight end um, for uh, Tennessee, who should be one of the starters, it looks like, with Holden Stays, who came in, transfer from Notre Dame, who had a lot of success there. So Tennessee replacing two tight ends for, uh, from a year ago, Jacob Warren, longtime starter, he moves on. Uh, McAllen Castles, transfer from UC Davis, who was really good this past year for Tennessee. He's also moved on to the NFL. So a lot of production. I think it's an overlooked part of the Tennessee offense is how important the tight end position is. And Tennessee likes playing two tight ends. So they need those guys to uh, get quickly acclimated, be ready to go. So I'm really interested to see what the tight ends look like on uh, Saturday. I think for me, 
Um, they're going to be really cautious with the running backs. I mean, Tennessee's got to figure out um, who's going to be uh, the running back room going into this year. I mean, Dylan Sampson's going to be the guy, the main guy. But after that, Cam Selden out for the spring, um, who's slated to be the number two. We'll see um, what Tennessee looks like um, past him. Will it be Deshaun Bishop? Will it be Kaliva Keith? Uh, Peyton Lewis, also their new freshman. He won't be uh, at the spring game, um, and he's missing the spring. So true freshman, four-star. Uh, for them so they're kind of thin at the running back spot and you have a new running backs coach and Darrell Sims who uh, came in with Jerry Mack taking the do- the job with the Jaguars this offseason so get, getting to in a sense of if there will be any changes if they go in the portal this spring that opens up in a, in a week I think this weekend will be kind of telling in terms of where Tennessee's at on that depth uh, side of things and if they do need to dip in the portal a little bit more this spring but for me my number one is still the receivers because I think Tennessee's never been deeper um, in the hypo era at the receiver position, you got five-star freshman uh, Mike Matthews coming in. Um, you've got uh, Brandon Staley, who's also a four-star from South Carolina. There, I'm curious to see how much run they get. And as you know, the hypo offense, I mean, <laughs> it, it's one of those things where the receivers, they play so much. And because tempo is such a big part of it, it's a hard position to learn. And hypo's offense, a lot of option stuff that it just takes time to master. I think uh, a lot of folks got really excited about Dante Thornton. Last year, the transfer from Oregon, um, he really came on once he moved from slot to outside and unfortunately got hurt down the stretch, but he was really coming into his own on the outside. I'm curious where how he looks in year two in the system because Jalen Hyatt really made that leap year two um, with Josh Heupel, Cedric Tillman also the same way. You look at um, that position, Brew McCoy, um, he won't be uh, available this spring as he continues to get back from his injury last year. But I'm really curious to see which run, which receivers pop this spring because I think it, there's just so much competition and they don't have the reps and opportunities um, come game day that some of these other position groups have because they just don't rotate um, as much. So I think there's a lot of competition and it's a lot of intriguing depth uh, at that position and there's just not as many spots. So I'm, I'm very curious how that starts to look this spring. Chase, I'm guessing a lot of people that just heard the comment out of your mouth concerning the wide receiver depth are a bit surprised because then the three following names that you mentioned always, of course, played uh, big in that 2022 season. One was a Blitnikoff award mm-hmm. winner. And then you've got Tillman and you mentioned Brew McCoy as well, that this group could be even deeper than that group two years ago. Oh, I think it's a lot deeper than what they were two years ago. Like one of the things about two years ago was Tennessee was very fortunate with health. Um, a lot of their main cogs were healthy, and that's a big part of it. I mean, Hendon Hooker was obviously electric and um, unbelievably efficient for Tennessee, but you had Jalen Hyatt, who was healthy all year. You had Cedric Tillman, who did unfortunately was banged up for a lot of that um, season. But you look at um, Burr McCoy, who was healthy that full year. I think with this year, what you're seeing or what you'll potentially see is that Tennessee has more options than that they've ever had where they don't have to like just count on those three big cogs to be healthy for them to make a deep run. I think if you don't have a Brew McCoy 100%, then like you still have a Caleb Webb who has been around for a while. You feel good about Dante Thornton in year two. You bring in Chris Brazel, the transfer from Tulane. Where does he fit in? Does he actually end up winning a starting job? So I think there's just a lot of competition on that front. So if you do have some injury stuff, if you do have some different things that you're just you're that you may or may not be concerned about. I just look at it as if you're a Tennessee fan, this should be exciting because we know how important the receiver uh, position is uh, under Josh Heupel. We've seen the success with Jalen Hyatt and Cedric Tillman and Brew McCoy to this point. Squirrel White, especially two in the slot, that you just, you, there's just so many different unique options for Nico as he takes over uh, his first year in the in the system as the QB one that I just think it's, it's exciting. And I also just think it can go a lot of different ways because the competition is so fierce with young guys, vets, transfers, mainstays. It's, it's going to be fun to watch. Folks, please like the video and uh, subscribe right here at the voice of college football. And uh, you see Chase's uh, info right there. You can uh, trail all of his uh, content there. I believe on X at uh, pod chase Thomas, Uh, any other good ways to find and track what you're doing on a daily basis, Chase? Oh, yeah. Um, I also joined. I'm the senior editor of the Players Lounge, Tennessee. So if you'd like to read me, I'm writing there every single day as well on that front. So if you're a Tennessee fan and you're not reading us there yet, um, go check us out. We have videos with all kinds of athlete driven content from the YouTube page. So all kinds of Tennessee athletes all across football, basketball, baseball, uh, women's softball, Lady Balls basketball. Um, we were doing that um, a lot and 
as we continue to grow that platform. That's been a lot of fun. So I've enjoyed my time there. So if you'd like to read me, but also if you want to watch me, YouTube page, YouTube, uh, Chase Thomas podcast, you can go to the website, chasethomaspodcast.com, where you can get access to all my previous episodes, everything that I'm uh, doing daily uh, with the National Sports Show, not just if you're a Vols fan, but obviously a lot of Vols coverage on the podcast too. But we we talk about it all on uh, on the on the on the show. Chase, I'm finding myself doing the same thing with uh, Nico that I was doing with DJ Uyangalele a couple years ago when, when I wouldn't say his name for a couple months and then I'd phonetically spell it out and be like, okay, someday I'll, I'll be able to just roll this off my tongue. But uh, that took a couple years or whatever it took. But uh, same thing with Nico. More importantly is, the, is his progression, of course. So for you, is this simply just, hey, he is showing all the attributes. He just needs the reps. He just needs the 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 takes and the 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 snaps or are there certain parts of his game that you I, I don't want to say the word concern but you think that need to be drastically improved um I think when you look at Nico I mean in the bowl game one of the things that I thought stood out to me um against Iowa like he ran the ball really well what surprised me is a, a really good Iowa front seven Tennessee had no problem putting Nico in arm's way in terms of running the football. And that's a, something that they were lacking. I think a lot of 2023 was Hinden Hooker um, was so good uh, making something out of nothing when the when the first read wasn't there, when what the design play was, he he was so quick to make a decision and be like, all right, I'm taking off. I'm getting a first down. He did that a bunch in the Florida game two years ago at home. He was able to do that against Alabama, obviously, a few weeks later. What, that was something that was, I think, missing last year um, in this offense. And I think Nico is going to be so much more comfortable being able to do a lot of those things that uh, Hendon Hooker was able to do. But I also think he's going to be able to operate outside of structure more than we've seen any quarterback um, in the Hypel era do. And I think that was something that Hendon just mastered um, the Hypel offense better than I maybe anybody will just because of how efficient he was. And he just always made the right decision. But the one thing about Hendon, and you saw it kind of in the Georgia game, was that when things did break down or if the offensive line was struggling, it was just a uh, he wasn't going to create on the fly. He wasn't going to be able to improvise a way like a Bryce Young was able to improvise. And there's uh, there's a reason that people who've seen Nico and seen a little bit of him is like he looks kind of in moves and throws like a big Bryce Young. Um, obviously, a gigantic frame um, has put on weight this offseason. Um, for me, I'm curious. I mean, they'll probably pick their spots. They're not going to run Nico a bunch against um, UT Chattanooga to open things up. They're not going to let him take hits there, but he's going to have to run. And I think that was something that was missing with this offense last year is Nico is going to have to be able to take off. He's going to have to run the football a lot. He's going to have to put a lot of fears because that was something that opened up the passing game two years ago, too, was that defenses had to account for Hendon Hooker and his legs. It had to account for him making something out of nothing. So it put uh, a lot more pressure on on uh, opposing defenses and I think Nico for me I'm so curious what a improviser looks like at quarterback in this offense because we haven't seen someone uh, of Nico's ilk uh, at Tennessee to this point so what does that look like we've seen what Joe Milton and that kind of skill set looks like in Heupel's offense we've seen what Hendon Hooker's skill set looks like in this offense we haven't seen somebody who is able to do uh, all the different things and be as versatile potentially as a Nico Yamayaba. So I'm very, very curious what that does for this offense to have somebody who is able to improvise to the extent that Nico already showed a little bit. But I guess the main big question I still have is he didn't throw the ball downfield at all against Iowa. So what does that look like? Do we open it up more from two years ago? Or is that still something that Tennessee doesn't do as much as they did two years ago? As you know, Chase, uh, this Tennessee team two years ago gained so much national notoriety because it was a dormant program for a long time, you know, a all-time great program that has a magical season, pulls off these great upsets, uh, becomes a top five type of team and was fun to watch. And then last year, anytime a team of any kind of national attention suffers a couple early losses, they kind of fall off the radar nationally at least. And I don't know that people appreciate how much work's been done on the defensive side to take what was in uh, in shambles, you know, a couple of years earlier and make it a uh, from just most metrics, both the traditional and the advanced, the top 25 to 30 defense in the country. Yeah, I mean, I think the defense could be really good. I think James Pierce has potential to potentially be the number one pick in the draft next year. And I don't think a lot of folks are 
ready for that uh because i think everyone thinks and they think tennessee if you're a college football fan you think hypo you think high scoring you think offense 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 but tim banks the uh, defensive coordinator has done a great job rodney garner as the defensive line coach has been exceptional developing a lot of talent across the defensive line uh tim banks this offseason has talked about like this should be the best defensive line in the country potentially um i think that's fair there's a lot of depth there i think tennessee has a lot of leos that they are going to rotate um, on the edge and it starts with James Pierce. James Pierce is uh, he's a beast. He had a pick six in that Iowa bowl game. He's sacking quarterbacks. He's just he's so good and he has those he has those intangibles. He has that versatility on the edge that just there aren't going to be a lot of tackles in the sport who are going to be, be able to handle him. Um, they're not going to have the bodies and you saw James Pierce just wreck havoc, especially in the South Carolina game. He made Spencer Rattler's life <laughs> extremely miserable. Um, I'm very excited to see what a just loaded front seven looks like for Tennessee. They're older. Um, they have a lot of depth, the veteran aspect of it. But I think too, the reason that I think it's so important to um, have this kind of defense is like, we've come to expect that Tim Banks' uh, defensive philosophy is going to be good when it comes to uh, limiting the run. Like teams have not quietly been able to run on Tennessee the last few years. Um, that's been one of the staples of Tim Banks's defense is like there's been some Tennessee fans who get a little frustrated with the bend don't break stuff uh, that Tennessee's not been able to get off the field sometimes. That was something that was more of an issue uh, a couple of years ago than of late. But I think this year in particular, what I'm so fascinated by is that you're going to have a lot of new faces in the secondary. Uh, Wesley Walker's gone. Uh, Jalen McCullough is gone. Um, you have uh, a lot of new faces who are coming. Kamal Haddon, who was arguably your best corner last year, he's gone. But you have a lot of depth and you've recruited really well on that side of the ball and you've prioritized defense in a lot of these recent classes that you're going to need this defensive line to be one of the best in the SEC because you're just starting a lot of new people and you're replacing a lot of production on that back end in the secondary. And I think there's going to be a learning curve there. So you need that defensive line to pick up the slack to make things easier for these young DBs who are super talented blue chippers, but they're going to need time to get uh, get acclimated and a great defensive line will help that uh, big time. Folks, please like and subscribe. That's all we ask here at the Voice of College Football. And again, uh, track what Chase has going on. Chase Thomas, the uh, Chase Thomas podcast, of course. And I'm looking at the transfer portal. And you mentioned mm -hmm. a few minutes ago, it all opens back up on next Monday. So here we go for another round of this. <laughs> uh, Tennessee thus far has gained eight. They've lost 12. And I'm seeing Danico Slaughter, Tyler Barron among the misses, and I'm not necessarily seeing, and I want you to correct me if I'm wrong, as many gains that seem to be matching the losses thus far. So my first question would be, do you think that's correct that maybe Tennessee's lost a little bit more than they've gained? And then also, what are the needs uh, in the transfer portal and how aggressive do you think they'll be? I don't think they're gonna be aggressive. I mean, what we've seen early, like a lot from the spring, like it's hard to come in this late in the process. I think um, a lot of those guys, you saw Peyton Thorne this past year. He He's a late uh, transfer to Auburn. He really struggled uh, year one at Auburn. I think it's just a learning curve. And I think to get into the system and a new system this late in the process, I think it's just hard and asking a lot of these guys um, to be impact players. So I think if you're adding somebody at this point in the spring, it's a depth piece, not someone you're looking to count on. For Tennessee so if ten, like that's why I mentioned at the top with the running backs where it's like if they brought in a running back in the spring portal I don't think they're bringing in a running back because they want uh or they're they're wanting a new feature back they're not going to go after someone to pick up the slack as a difference maker type deal like a Quinshot Jenkins type they're not going to go that route what I think they might do is I mean running back I think is probably the most obvious to me of potentially maybe a guard they there's a guard they like because where there are some uh questions still at the left guard spot for Tennessee but I mean, by and large, they they're pretty deep. And one of the things you have to consider now um, with the portal and with when you talk about guys like Tyler Barron and um, Wesley Walker and uh, different guys just all across the board who've maybe departed in the portal um, to Marion McDonald is that part of the reason that you so you see the misses and you see on the outside, if you're not a fan of these teams, that. Uh, oh, this player was extremely productive and Tyler Barron was really good at Tennessee. Wesley Walker was a big time transfer from Georgia Tech who ended up playing a great role. It was one of the best safeties in the country. Um, Tamari McDonald was good in the star position. But part of that is you're OK as a, a, at Tennessee because you ha you've recruited well. So there are even though there are unproven guys coming in behind them, that doesn't mean that you have a need in the portal because you you have to eventually let these young guys play. 
And that's part of where I think Tennessee's at is I think they have a lot of talented young guys who are ready to step in to those roles um, that those guys were really good the last few years at Tennessee. But Tennessee, like Ricky Gibson at corner, you have Jordan Thomas, who figures to be there at the star spot. He's been in the system for a while. He should be ready to go. You have somebody like John Slaughter, who's going to compete. You bring in Jacoby Thomas from Middle Tennessee State, who's going to compete. You bring in Jamad McCoy from Oregon State. He's going to compete at that corner spot. I think they've brought in a lot of talent. They've added a lot of talent. Jordan Matthews is a former four-star. Where does he factor in at corner? Boo Carter, true freshman. He's super talented. I'm excited to see what he does. Um, He's going to be an instant impact guy on special teams. I think part of it is they just have so much new infusion of young talent that eventually these guys are going to have to play. Like you can't just all like eventually you have to start playing these young guys. And I think Tennessee is at a point where they are having to play some of these young guys. Like they, you, when you recruit well, this is part of the deal. <laughs> That's the, the goal is to get them on the field sooner rather than later with the portal in the portal era. And I think what you're going to see this fall is Tennessee um, start to make that jump from being transfer needy because of just the nature of coming in to a new staff, losing 30 plus kids when Hypo first got here and having to really um, slowly build this program. Now he's built it. Now they have a lot of depth and now they have four and five stars who are ready to play. And that's just part of it. Like they got to get on the field. And I think that's just where Tennessee's at at the moment. And Chase talking about young guys, Ethan Utley, a defensive lineman Mm -hmm. out of Nashville. He's their latest commit of seven in 2025. Your thoughts just about how recruiting's going, big targets out there. Uh, are people satisfied with the Josh Heupel recruiting effort at this point? I think people are mostly pleasantly surprised. I think if you were somebody who thought Tennessee would, um, if you're someone who wants Tennessee to be, if you're a Tennessee fan, you want to see them at the top five every year. I just, you're not going to be happy. Like that's, it's just hard. Like you look at who's ahead of them. And I, I always ask this question of people who get frustrated with where Tennessee's at. If they're, they're somewhere in that 10 to 13 range, more years than not, that still puts you in the blue chip ratio of teams that can win a national title. You want to be somewhere in that top 15 is what I've always said. It's like, if you're in there, you're going to have one of the 10 to 15 best rosters in the sport. And that's a good spot to be in, especially with the expanded playoff. Like that is a healthy spot. That's a healthy program. Um, You're not going to get everybody. Tennessee fans are always going to be wishing for more. They're always going to be, but it's like, you just brought in that the class that you're talking about with Ethan Utley. He's a big get, um, best player on the defensive side of the ball in the state of Tennessee. You get the best offensive player in George McIntyre in this class, five-star quarterback. He's also with this group. Let's see what he's able to do um, as a peer recruiter in the 2025 uh, class. You have Rodarius Jackson um, over there in Memphis, four-star receiver. You have uh, Dodson in the boat, another four-star receiver. I think Tennessee, they're, they're in on a lot of other big names, the receiver spot. But I think you got to be happy. I think Tennessee has developed really well. They're right there in that blue chip ratio. They'll be, I think right now I looked at on three this week. They're somewhere in that 12 to 13 range in terms of blue chip uh, players going into 2024. That's good. Like I think for hypo and the questions coming in of that kind of jump from UCF to Tennessee, he's done a really good job. And I think the staff has done a really good job. And Chase, you mentioned the 12 or soon to be 14 team playoff. And what that does to a fan base like Tennessee. And we talked a little fan psyche before we started to record. And on one hand, I got to think that when it was just a 14 playoff, sure, there were a lot of frustrated fan bases out there thinking, okay, we've got the same six or seven teams competing for playoff spots every year and making the playoffs. But now that it's, and that in a sense, for some fans being a bit of an excuse to say, hey, we go nine and three, 10 and two, and then every so often we can get ourselves in a playoff position. That would be phenomenal. I'm good. I understand there's only four spots. That's really tough to do. But now that it goes to 12 to 14, is there almost more pressure that you need to make a 12 or 14 team playoff? If you can't make the top 12 or 14 in the country, you you need to be doing that at a place like Tennessee. Well, I think the next two years is going to be huge. Obviously, all eyeballs are going to be on Nico Yamaliava, right? Like I just I think if Tennessee does not make a playoff appearance with Nico in these next two years, I think that's a problem for the fan base. I think the fan base will be pretty, um, pretty disappointed. I think um, you'll lose a lot of electricity um, if that's the case, because that probably means a lot went wrong in the Nico era. If you don't make the CFP one of these next two years, because I think what we've seen is just elite quarterback play is just such an elevator in this sport. And when you have a Heisman-esque quarterback and you have a 
roster that's going to be in that top 15 in the country that should account to a lot of wins. I mean, Tennessee, one of the things I pit, I actually going into 2023, I predicted that Tennessee would go 10 and two and that got a lot of pushback. And I like, I literally called this out Carolina game and uh, splitting Alabama and Georgia. But part of that was, is because a, I love Hendon hooker and what I believed in what this offense could be with him. But it was also Tennessee was the only power five team in 2020, uh, 2021, to not win 10 games had, that had a top 10 scoring offense. That was it. Everyone else was a 10 win plus one team. This offense is the name of the game in this sport. If you have an elite offense, you have a chance to win double digit games every single year because it's just that's just the way the rules are. That's the way the sport has gone. Tennessee is in a position now with Nico and with the like I talked about with the wide receiver depth with the offensive line. This this year is just you bring in five star transfer a tackle Lance Hurd to be the left tackle. You have John Campbell, who was great at left tackle last year. He slides over to the right. You have Cooper Mays back for another year. You have Javante Spragans back for another year. at Right guard, left guard. We'll see how it plays out. But ultimately, you're really deep. You're an older team. You have maybe the best edge rusher in all of the sport this year. If Tennessee is not a playoff team, I think some stuff went really wrong and it's uh you hope that's not the case as a fan but i just think there's so many reasons for optimism right now that tennessee will end up making the cfp um, the next two years because it's just i think nico is going to be really good i think this team is really really deep on both sides of the ball and i i, th- I like their schedule like this schedule to me looks like a 10 and 2 11 and 1 type season you get florida and bam at home this year that's good I actually prefer the Georgia game on the road because that way you get one of those more coin flip games at home at Tennessee because it's not really a coin flip uh, as we've seen. Like Georgia's just a different kind of beast altogether that you kind of would rather uh, that be a road game. So if you you get a big upset win, great. We got it on the road and we also got those big home games because I think being at home was huge against South Carolina last year. It was huge against A&M last year, getting both those games at home. Josh Heupel has only lost one home game in the last two years, and that was to the best program in the in the sport in Georgia last year. So Heupel has done an extremely uh, good job of winning his home games. The place is electric. There's just so much pressure in his kind of offense in Nealon when you have a stadium and a coliseum that's built like Tennessee. It's hard when you get in a hole against this offense and the crowd's really rocking. It's just hard not to let things unravel. We've seen Kentucky unravel. We've seen South Carolina unravel. We saw NM unravel. It's just, it's hard uh, when things go awry against this uh, iteration of uh, Tennessee football. So for me, I look at the schedule. It's just prime for a 10 and two plus run. And I think if you're in the SEC and you win 10 plus games, you're going to find yourself in the college football playoff, especially uh, with this expansion. A lot of money spent on the old coach to get him out the door and the new coach. But here we go with the new era at Texas A&M with Mike Elko and uh, the remarkable job, of course, he did at Duke. We've got Graham Harmon on the line, Gigum Gazette. Graham, we appreciate you stopping by to break things down. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me on. Just a couple of days uh, in the door at spring practice. So we will get to that in just a second. Wanted to hit you up on the latest in regards to recruiting. I see four hard commits for 2025. So, of course, things just getting started. We're just on the cusp of that season, of course, Graham. Once spring practice clears and uh, all those uh, camps are, are underway in May and June, and then we start to see some activity in the summer. But uh, who are some of those targets to, to be looking out for right now? Absolutely. Well, uh, it's another huge uh, crop of prospects in the state of Texas this upcoming year, almost as good, maybe even better than it was in 2022, which was, of course, a huge reason that A&M had such a huge class that year. Um, And uh, some of the top prospects, uh, you got uh, three big time offensive tackles up in the Dallas area. You got Ty Haywood. Uh, and Denton Ryan, you got Michael Fasusi at Louisville, and you got uh, Lamont Rogers and Mesquite Horn. All three of those are guys that AM is really trying to uh, trying to get in on. Uh, Fasusi visited this last weekend reportedly and is thinking about coming down again. Um, so those are three big prospects, and a couple that AM already has in the boat from the DFW area um, are uh, DeAndre Ryden uh, and Kelvion Riggins, so a running back and a linebacker uh respectively and those are it's good to see that um Jimbo and his staff had really fallen off in the Dallas area um and there's a huge concentration of talent up there uh in this upcoming class like I say as there is all over the state and so Elko and company they're already trying to get you know 
uh, presence um, up there. And um, I, I think they're off to a good start with those two commits. Graham, it's certainly impossible to tell from any game results. Uh, Mike Elko still has to even get the team on the field just here in the first few days of spring camp. And then we've got summer conditioning on into to fall camp. But at this point, is there any decided difference in the way that Jimbo ran the program and at least what we're hearing out of Mike Elko and what could be a contrast in, in approaches? You know, you got to be careful a lot of the times when a, a coach goes out the door and fans are happy to see him go with some of the reporting that comes out. Sometimes people are, are saying what they feel like people want to hear. That said, I, I do think sort of the consensus um, as Jimbo was out the door was that discipline overall as a program had really kind of petered out. Uh, in the in the last few years uh, of his time, and I, I think that was reflected on the field a fair amount. Uh, you know, it was a perennial storyline: the the talent that Anna would bring in and the results that they weren't getting, right? And so I, I think a lot of that was traced back to discipline in the program. And uh, from all accounts, Elko has completely turned that around, made that a huge emphasis. Very, very detail-oriented guy. You can just tell by listening to his interviews, the way he talks about things, the way he went about when he was just flying solo before he even built the staff. When he came into town, he was going to every uh, high school, basically, in the state of Texas, it felt like, multiple stops a day. And he had this whole thing uh, set up very, um, very methodical, very detail-oriented, like I say. And um, from the little bits we've been able to see of spring practice, it looks like that attitude has carried over into the practice field. You know, if you don't, uh, if you don't do the drill right, you you got to do it again, that sort of thing. Um, so, uh, you know, it's it's early, like you say, no game results, but that definitely seems to be a, a big change. All right, let's break down the offense now, and of course, Connor Weekman. Uh... I thought he was pretty impressive despite uh, a rough game down in Miami against the Canes early last season. A lot of pressure put on him to throw the ball something like 50 plus times. The offensive line not doing the job, but he hung in there and kept Texas A&M in the game. Unfortunately, we got to see him very little after that, of course, with the season ending injury, but 69% completion percentage and really uh, no quarterback battle here. Correct. As long as Connor Wiegman is upright and healthy. Pretty much. Uh, yeah, Elko said he's the number one guy going into the spring. Um, still recovering a little bit from that ankle injury uh, that he sustained in the Auburn game. Just by nature of the injury, it's going to take a little bit for him to be back at full speed. Um, but as far as I can tell uh, from the reporting, it, it's mainly going to limit his running. Um, so he'll be able to stand in there and and throw and all that sort of thing. But it will be really interesting to see who stacks up behind him. Um, you got Jalen Henderson and Marcel Reed, both of which saw time after all the <laughs> injuries that AM had at quarterback uh, last year. And both were impressive. Um, Henderson was the third string guy and Reed was the fourth string guy. And Henderson had to come in uh, at the Mississippi State game. And that was, uh, funnily enough, it was Jimbo's last game, but it was a game the Aggies won 51 to 10. Uh, and that had a lot to do with how impressive Henderson was running the offense. Uh, and he looked promising the first half against LSU until it really the whole team ran out of gas, especially the defense trying to contain Jaden Daniels and, you know, their uh, amazing <laughs> receiving core. Um, and then Henderson gets hurt in the first play of the bowl game, and then you have this true freshman come in, Marcel Reed, and, I mean, I, once I saw Henderson go down, I basically threw up my hands. I, I thought that was it for the game, and uh, obviously the Aggies didn't end up winning, but Reed looked great. Uh, he could run, he could throw, he could throw on the run. Um, so I, it definitely feels like Reed has a higher ceiling, whether he can get to that and establish himself above Henderson in camp. You know, hopefully this is all theoretical too. Yeah. Hopefully Wegman is able to play healthy the whole season and we don't have to see these guys take meaningful snaps, but with the way things have gone a quarterback in the last couple years, I think a lot of Aggie fans feel like just a sort of uh, 
grim feeling that it might become relevant at some point during the season. Yeah, 361 yards off the bench, coming off uh, the cold bench and uh, having to relieve uh, Henderson rather quickly in that game is pretty impressive. Mm -hmm. uh, back to Wiegman, is it just a matter of, as long as he's healthy, just a matter of this guy just needs reps to get better? Or are there particular aspects of his game that people are looking to see him decidedly improve on? You know, um, I think the thing that he had the toughest time with last year was, and, and I, I suppose you could also chalk this up to just the way Jimbo's offense works, because the offensive line and the rest of the offense, from what I've read about it, are basically speaking two different languages. So it can be very hard to, to, to pull this off identifying blitzers and, and making pre-snap reads as far as where the pressure is coming from. That was the biggest issue in the Miami game. Um, I mean, he still was making some insane throws uh, in that game. If you just go back and watch the tape, I mean, he's running for his life and he's just putting it on a dot to the receiver. It's, it's really impressive stuff, but you know, it, if he had identified the pressure, right, you know, it would, would have been a little unnecessary. So Maybe that's just a function of Jimbo's offense. Maybe that is Wegman needs to improve seeing the field pre-snap. But that was definitely the biggest thing that jumped that last season. I mean, honestly, just the, all the physical ability is there. <laughs> all the it, it ne never seemed like he was making a wrong read or a bad read or throwing into traffic uh, when he was throwing on the run. Like I say, more often than not, it would be really accurate. His deep ball's great. I'm really high on him coming into the season. So I just, if, if he can get that piece of things cleaned up and maybe in Colin Klein's offense, it just automatically will happen for him. But if he can get that piece of things cleaned up, I, I'm really excited to see what he'll do this season. We've got uh, Graham Harmon here from Gigum Gazette, breaking down Texas A&M football. The Aggies just hit the practice field just a few days ago to get started. You can join Graham right there at uh, Gigum Gazette as we run through the offense. Uh, running back, Samari Daniels, and of course, Le'Veon Moss basically split carries, both totaled about 500 yards rushing, about five yards per carry. Is there one guy in particular that you like better, or do they complement each other pretty well in regards to their skill sets? I prefer Moss. Um he is he's more of an all-around back in in the 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 game just felt the running game just felt easier when he was in um daniels had flashes of brilliance he had some huge like breakout carries but he just doesn't he's not as physically talented as moss is to my eyes um but i don't want to forget about reuben owens either you know that he was a true freshman last year he uh i mean he can fly when he gets in the open field, the, the problem was running through contact last year. Um, you know, being in Tommy Moffat's strength and conditioning program, I think help him build up a little bit of, a little bit of bulk. And he has a, he is as high a ceiling as anybody, honestly, uh, in, in the, in the conference, he's, he's that physically talented. It's just, um, and, and he's great receiving skills too, out of the backfield. Um, so don't want to forget about him. Uh, Moss, I think, I mean, I'd be surprised if he's not the guy who trots out there with the first team offense against Notre Dame though. Um, so he's, he's the one I would take, um, to be, to be the starter and EJ Smith transfer they brought in from Stanford, sort of a third down back. He's almost as good a, a receiver as he is a running back. Um, he'll be kind of a situational guy, but that's basically the room at this point. Folks, we appreciate you stopping by here at the Voice of College Football. We got uh, Graham Harmon here from Gigum Gazette. Of course, join him there. And uh, please like the video and subscribe here at the Voice of College Football, covering the SEC top to bottom here on the channel you're most likely watching. All right. Wide receivers. Of course, it's a disappointment to see a guy like Evan Stewart take off for Oregon. Anaya Smith moves on to the NFL what does uh, the position look like at this point? Well, um, like I said with Owens, the potential is really high. Um, it, the top line talent is great. The depth is a big issue. 
Um, they brought in, well, technically three guys. One was a preferred walk-on from the transfer portal. Um, Jabre Barber from Troy, Cyrus Allen from Louisiana Tech, and then Wesley Watson from Kansas State. Um, all came in, and Barber and Allen, I think both kind of fit that slot Anaya Smith role, uh, kind of explosive in the open field. Uh, and that's a slot that, you know, pun not intended, but that A&M doesn't really have someone in with an ice leaving. Um, he was just such a, he was such a leader, uh, and such a, you need a big play. He'll go out and make it. Anias was. And so it definitely hurts to see him leave, but, uh, Jade Walker, the transfer from Grand Valley state really emerged at the end of last season. Moose Muhammad if he can be consistent, could be one of the best receivers in the nation. I mean, he makes highlight catches basically every time he gets more than 10 snaps in a game. Um, and um, Noah Thomas, another name to watch. He, I think, three touchdowns in the first game, but then he got injured and didn't play very much uh, the rest of the year or wasn't able to go at 100% really. Um, huge red zone weapon at six foot six. Uh, Micah Tees, uh, going to be a, uh, I don't think he kept his red shirt. He'll, he'll be a sophomore. Um, he's another kind of explosive uh, in the open field guy. Um, flipped from Arkansas on signing day last year. And uh, he's, you know, exciting with his potential, but he's just not not proven, you know. Um, so you got four of those guys. You got uh, two freshmen, well, three freshman receivers coming in, uh, and then three from the portal. A lot that needs to be proven at that position, though. And certainly, Graham, between Muhammad Thomas and Walker, we're talking about three guys that totaled, oh, let's see, let's do the math, 81 catches and nine touchdowns. So they have played. They've been productive receivers, not star receivers. But with uh, Stewart and Smith out of the way, there's certainly opportunity for more targets and for these guys to post bigger numbers. And with more consistent quarterback play, hopefully – with Wigman sticking around for the entire season. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and Stewart um, played in only one of the last four games. I think he played against Prairie View, but he missed Mississippi State, LSU, and he was already transferred by the bowl game. And Walker was the guy who stepped up in his absence. Walker made a lot of plays, especially in the bowl game, and just a mind boggling catch, I, I think, of specifically against LSU, where he ran downfield and Henderson had to sling it to him. Basically it felt like he was falling out of bounds and he caught it. And he, uh, by all accounts, great locker room guy, really hard worker. Um, a guy that a lot of AM fans are ready to see have a huge season. So he's one that um, was not very heralded coming in from Grand Valley state, but I, I think a lot of Aggie fans are really pleased with the way he looked near the end of the year last year. And then Graham, a tight end, of course, you got Donovan Green. He was supposed to be the starter, I believe, last year, went down with the ACL. And you bring in two transfers with uh, Garrett Miller and Trey Watson coming in from Purdue and uh, Fresno State, and they posted pretty decent seasons with 38 and 30 catches. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the Getting Donovan back is huge. Uh, he had a great freshman season. Um, obviously he loses Jake Johnson there, follows his brother Max to North Carolina. Donovan, um, even though Jake was, was ranked higher and he was injured their true freshman year. And then Donovan was injured last year. Uh, and I expected Jake to maybe break out a little more than he did. Um, and maybe some of that has to do with the inconsistency at quarterback, but we're all excited to see green back. I think he tore his ACL in like one of the last scrimmages before uh, the season started. So that was a tough blow, but he's going to be great. Um, a guy that a lot of AM fans are excited about is Theo Mellenorstrom uh, from Sweden. He's like six foot seven and can run a four or five 40. He's like athletic freak just needs to, you know, reps to play the game and all that sort of thing. So this will be his third year at the collegiate level. If they can unlock him, there's a lot of potential there. Um, but Miller and Watson, um, Watson was a late flip, uh, because 
he had committed to DeBoer at uh, Washington before DeBoer left to go to Alabama. Uh, and so a was able to get him in the boat. He and Miller, um, I definitely think they'll be crucial because um, Klein uses so many uh, kind of that H back. Uh, he uses tight ends a lot in his offense. Uh, I mean, he's so multiple, so he uses them all over the all, all different kinds of formations. Um, so having uh, multiple receiving options at the position, I think can't, the, the importance of that can't really be understated. Folks, keep it locked in here at the Voice of College Football. Just here in the past week or so, we've taken uh, a spring tour around uh, Alabama, LSU, now Texas A&M. We've got Auburn and uh, others on the way, Arkansas as well. Got uh, Graham Harmon here, and you can catch him on Gigum Gazette. Okay, the offensive line. Now, maybe this is just a stereotype for me, but with a and having the issues that they've had over the course of Jimbo's tenure. And then once it became apparent that they weren't going to meet expectations and that he would really need to turn things around, my thought was always, okay, well, they can't find a quarterback or Jimbo's screwing up the quarterback with too complicated of an offense or an outdated offense or something. But never is the problem not never, but typically in the trenches, especially in the defensive side and that front seven on defense, they, they've recruited just so well and they played pretty well on that side. And then the same thing with the offensive line. Uh, but I, I do see that uh, pretty much everybody's coming back from that side of the football. And, and how do you feel about the offensive line performance last year and how it projects this season? Well, Maybe a dose of spring Kool-Aid, but I think everyone's hoping that the offensive line struggles from the last two years mostly have to do with departed coach Steve Adazio. Um, things really took a nosedive in 2022 uh, along the offensive front, and that coincided with his arrival after the departure of Josh Henson, who's obviously at Southern Cal now. And I honestly... I was a proponent of keeping Adazio around for 2023 just because I, I, I felt like continuity in the, at the, that. We back? Can you hear me? Okay, there we go. Yeah, you froze up uh, right about the point that, uh, can you hear me? You got me as well? Hey, Graham? Um, yes. You got me now? Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, I, I think it was on your end, I believe. So okay. um, you had just said that uh, you were a proponent to keep Adazio around because of the continuity. And that's, so just, just pick it up okay. wherever I'll be. Able yeah. To... Um, sure. Sure. Uh, he, um, the continuity didn't help uh, because 2023 was not, well, not quite as bad as 2022 was still pretty bad. Um, just miscommunications and it was all mental too. If you want to go back and watch the tape, I mean, you got guys like looking this way and you got a blitzer coming right here and they don't even like look over to try to pick him up. It, it, it was mind boggling. Some of the things we were seeing and it really did feel evident at one point that it came down to coaching. So Aggie fans, I think are really hopeful that a change there will help. We know we have a lot of talent there. Bryce Foster, Reuben Fathery had sensational freshman seasons at center and tackle, and they really regressed for the last two years. Um, Cam Dewberry, very skilled. Mark Naboo, very skilled. Um, Chase Basantis um, played his whole freshman season at tackle. More natural guard, though, so I think they'll likely move him inside. 
Um, Fathery was was injured a lot of last season, so I think they'll have him play uh, along the outside there. Trey Zoon actually had at left tackle a, a pretty good year last year. Um, now his freshman year, apparently he was playing with a bad injury the whole year, so maybe that's just seeing him injured the first year and then seeing him at full strength the next year. But you know, it's there's a lot of hope, but when is when is there not a lot of hope in spring, right? Um, but that is a unit that needs to play up to their potential if a and m is able to achieve what what we all want them to right uh this this year um uh, nine uh, even ten wins um you can't do that with such a porous uh offensive line like we have been seeing the last two years so that needs to be shored up uh and i think elko knows that uh, I think Coach Cushing knows that, and I think that is going to be a point of emphasis in the spring. The Simbo Fisher Bobby Petrino experiment only lasted one season, of course. And now you mentioned Colin Klein coming in from Kansas State. Based on reports, based on what he has had to say, what Mike Elko has had to say, do you expect any radical differences to the offense? Yeah, I mean, it's going to visually look a lot different. Um, he he has such an interesting blend of so many different things. I mean, like 1980s wing T and like 2010 spread, like from one snap to the next. He is so multiple in the things that he calls. But shockingly, it somehow seems much less complicated for the players than Jimbo's offense was, which, you know, looked the same the whole time. Um, and so he, he, he's so highly thought of in the coaching community from, from, uh, all, all reports, everything I can tell uh, for, for a reason, he is just a tough guy to prepare for. One of the things I think encapsulates this best Mark is when Kansas State played Texas last year, and Kansas State was a power running team. Like they predicated a lot of their game on that. Um, but Texas has Byron Murphy, Tavondre Sweat. You are not going to be able to run up the middle on them, especially with Kansas State's talent, right? And Klein didn't just run his head into a brick wall over and over. He's like, okay, I'm going to call this game differently. And Kansas State ends up losing, right? But they put up a huge passing performance by a quarterback who's just kind of a guy against uh, a pretty decent Texas defensive backfield because Klein is that adaptable and that multiple in the way he can call his offense. If that was Jimbo Fisher calling that, you get three and outs all day because he won't stop calling power left, power right, iso middle, whatever. So it's definitely, I think, going to visually be very different. With Texas A&M type resources, facilities, recruiting, all of it, and with what Mike Elko showed us in a brief time there at Duke, which I think is, again, I said, I used the term remarkable at the top, and I truly believe that because if you look at what Duke football was when he got there, they had one win in the ACC in like 17 games prior to his arrival and they stayed close to everyone his first season, went nine and four, didn't get blown out, came within a, a drive of making the ACC championship game, and then they lose Riley Leonard last year. Otherwise, they're leading at Florida State deep into the third quarter just to take that same roster and do what he did with it. It's pretty impressive. And now, of course, he's familiar with although in the transfer portal era, not as familiar with as many players on this roster as he might've been otherwise, but still he recruited a lot of these guys. So uh, it seems like a great fit. And I thought it was the home run hire of the off season. Yeah. You know, um, it definitely felt that way to A&M fans in light of the uh, Mark Stoops thing that happened <laughs> the day before. Uh, it certainly felt like a very welcome, um, welcome development. Although, there were fans, uh, and I won't say whether I was included in this number, who had their head in the clouds with Dan Lanning or Kalen DeBoer or that sort of thing. But the more the more we've had him around, the more we kind of think about kind of all those things you were saying, the familiarity with the roster and 
the the immediate impact that he had at Duke, really turning around, like getting so much out of those those players. Um, the more it has seemed like this could actually work like really quickly, especially when you look at the the schedule A and M has this upcoming year. Are their four biggest games are at home? Their toughest road trip is at Auburn. Uh, at the end of the year, and you know Hugh Freeze and Auburn, that's going to be that's not going to be a cakewalk by any means. But you know you get LSU, Texas, Notre Dame, and Missouri all at home. So uh, with the performance he was able to get out of Duke talent and the amount of talent we know we have on campus in College Station, if he can maximize that potential in the same way, I, this could be a really scary team this year. So many questions, so much waiting of when is Texas truly going to be back? Well, it all came together in 2023. And of course, it's now off to the SEC, a higher standard. And I think the the ceiling and through the roof is the sky for this uh, program, certainly going forward under Steve Sarkeesian. Nick Battles here, breaking down some Texas football for us. We're going to look at the offense here. Nick, we appreciate you stopping by. Of course, you can catch everybody on at Nino's Corner. And uh, Nick has joined us a number of times. And I totally recommend checking out his work. Uh, Nick, what's going on? Man, man, look, man, I'm good, man. How you doing? I am doing well. And, uh, you know, we haven't talked since the end of last season. So I'm just curious before we start to break down the offense, just how did you take all that in in regards to I, I'm sure that you weren't surprised because the the talent was all over the place, but the talent's been all over the place in various forms a number of times. But they put it all together. They came through and shoot, even though they got outplayed by Washington, by and large, they almost had a shot to win still. They had four <laughs> shots from the 12 yard line. Exactly. Wasn't, wouldn't that have been crazy? Exactly. Crazy game. Crazy game. Yeah, man, you know, Texas has always had the talent, but they've had it at the wrong positions, I think. You know, so we had Tom Herman, we had Strong. Those guys were recruiting a lot of guys at wide receiver and running back, but they didn't, you know, uh, I don't think they had the trenches right. You know, so during the last five years, you know, prior to Sark actually getting here, uh, Texas um, had the least amount of scholarship offensive linemen in the Big 12 tied with Kansas. So they had all the guys for running backs, wide receivers, quarterbacks, but the trenches were not sewed up. Steve Sarkeesian, his first two years, he's brought in 12 linemen, and it has been very fruitful for us. So I'm sure that you could produce a, a video on Arch Manning every day and probably <laughs> set records in terms of views. It's always the newest guy. And when you got the yeah. name Manning, but th there's another guy that I, I assume is going to hang out to his starting quarterback position. And he was the guy everybody was talking about like two years ago. And of yeah, course, Quinn Ewers. Quinn Ewers, who hit on 69% of his passes. So your thoughts about Quinn Ewers, how steady he was last season, uh, worked through an injury uh, during the back stretch. And, and came through um, leading them to the playoffs, of course. Yeah, man, I think Quinn's going to be great this year. You know, Texas fans, I think we get a little antsy about the quarterback position, right? We had Vince and we had Colt and, you know, and now it's Quinn and, you know, people get really antsy about it, but people forget that it took Vince Young to his fourth year to bring a championship here and to be like the guy, you know, um, you know, his, his third year at Texas, uh, Texas lost, well, yeah, Texas lost 12 to nothing against OU, all right? We didn't score a single point against OU, you know, so we were barely winning games this third year, uh, kind of similar, you know, like to this year. Um, and then Vince's last year, we took off. We we kind of killed everybody, you know, and then, you know, go up to uh, Cali and, you know, actually win the game there. So I think, I think Quinn is going to do really good things this year. We've lost a lot of talent, but we've gotten a lot of talent too, you know. So, uh, look, this is Quinn's year. This is year. And if there was any part of his game, Nick, that you would like to see him step up, uh, what would that be? Deep ball. <laughs> Got to hit that deep ball, man. And so Quinn's been doing it, right? So against Alabama last year, he did it. Um, last year against Houston, he did it as well. But it's just got to be, you know, if he can hit that at least once a game, I think it's going to really, you know, just make strides for the offense. Malik Murphy moves on to Duke. Good for him. Hopefully he can have a successful stay there. He's got a huge opportunity. The guy's a physical specimen. So with his absence, are you a little bit concerned 
you know, people would love to see Arch Manning. That would be a great story and all that sort of thing. Uh, nobody wants to see Quinn Ewers get get hurt, but it's the nature of the game. Mm -hmm. uh, just your thoughts about missing Murphy and, and having to go to a completely inexperienced option. You know, it helps to have, you know, a problem where your your second string quarterback is one of the most highly ranked, you know, guys in the history. You know, so you have Arch Manning come in. He's uh, actually been running the system here, you know, at Texas from his high school days to as well. Um, so he he knows the system in and out. You know, this kid was born to be a quarterback. Right. So his grandfather was a quarterback. Both his uncles were quarterbacks too, as well. Right. So, look, he. He's a guy that if he has to step in, I don't think Texas fans are going to be, you know, shocked if he does well. I think they'd be probably more shocked if he didn't do well. The legacy is really crazy when you really let it soak in from uh, Arch Manning, Archie Manning all the way down, <laughs> going back, you know, into the late 60s. All right. This running back room, of course, uh, Jonathan Brooks was the guy, but he got nicked up and knocked out. Uh, late last season after a thousand yard season and CJ Baxter, of course, the five star mm -hmm. uh, looked the part most of the time. And Jadon blue uh, certainly was a big factor. Yeah, man. Jaden blue. A lot of people love to forget, you know, Jaden blue didn't play his last year of high school, but prior to him sitting out that last year, Jaden blue was the number one run back in the country. And he was almost on the, you know, like on his, on his path to be a five star. And so once he didn't play his senior year, he dropped in the rankings, but you know, if you go back and look at the rankings, Texas, you know, had the had the top back in the state of Texas, you know, with Brooks. And then, you know, had Jaden Blue, who was the top back in the country prior, you know, to his senior year. And then you get the top back in the country again with Baxter. And I think when Brooks got hurt last year, it kind of opened up things. And and Blue was a speedster, man. He's a he's a guy that next year at the combine, he's going to run a four three. Um, and he's a big guy, too. He's about six foot, maybe like 200 pounds or so. But he's he's a fast guy. A lot of speed and, uh, you know, him and Baxter are going to be a hell of a one-two punch here. And by the way, thanks for correcting me on Jaden Blue. You know, mm -hmm. that that's a name I would have gotten right during the playoffs. <laughs> but, you know, the offseason's long and I forgot. So we want to get uh, the young men's names correct. We move on to wide receiver and there's a lot of names headed out the door, of course. A.D. Mitchell, Jadavian Sanders, who I was always impressed with. Yeah, JT. I'm, I'm looking forward to see what he does uh, at the next level. Jordan Whittington. And of course, Xavier Worthy. So that's a lot of talent out the door, but we know how Texas recruits. So what's the next group look like? It's going to be wonderful. You know, Texas gets the top guy from Bama, you know, getting Bond to come in. Um, you got John T. Cook, uh, who was also one of the top guys in the country last year coming out as well. Um, you have Ryan Wingo. He's a true freshman, came from St. Louis, about 6'2", 210 pounds. And I think he ran out like a 10'4", or something in the 100-meter dash coming out of high school. He's a guy that just has a different gear, you know, just a different speed as well. Getting Matthew Golden from Houston, too, as well. Another speedster guy. And then you got guys like Ryan Niblett, you know, who came in from the class last year, who also ran a 10'3", or 10'4". So Sark is building his team around a lot of speed. Um, and then look, man, you got DeAndre Moore. I keep forgetting about Moore, you know, who came from California last year as well. So this is his second year in the system. And it look, Sark has his guys, you know, Sark has his guys. And we still got a guy named Silas Bolden, you know, so he's coming from what's Oregon State. So he should be here, you know, sometime in the summer. And so it, look, Sark has his room. He's going to always keep it packed and stacked. And, and kids who are wide outs and tight ends, they are going to want to come play at Texas. And then, you know, so talking about JT Sanders, he's going out for the draft, right? So uh, we got Gunnar Helm, who's outstanding, great blocker, great catcher. But we also got Nye Black, too, from Alabama, too, as well. Um, a big freaky 6'4", 215-pound tight end, who's probably running 4'5 next year at the Combine, too, as well. And so Texas has the talent stacked up. Um, and as long as Texas can just protect the quarterback and keep that, keep that line straight, I think Texas is going to be really good on the offense this year. You mentioned off the top, Nick, uh, the difference between this Texas team and the ones that failed in the past. And a lot of that might be some mental toughness, some playing uh, mistake free, that sort of thing. But you most specifically went to the line of scrimmage. The trenches. And so for the offensive line, they've got four coming back, I see. Yeah. Yeah. So look, man, we got Kelvin Banks Jr. is probably going to be the first tackle, you know, next year off the board. Um, you got DJ Campbell, who's playing right guard. Um, Sanders going to be Jake Majors. He's been the steady guy there for the for the last five years. Um, you know, so Christian Jones is going up to the draft this year, but we got a big guy named Cam Williams, 
It's about six foot six, six foot seven, about 350, 360 pounds at right tackle. Uh, he's a, he's a wall, you know, and he's very physical, uh, very, just really, really good feet as well. The thing is going to be at, you know, at a left guard, we got Hayden Connor at left guard, you know, so he's been a starter there for three years, but there's a lot of talent behind him. You got Cole Hudson, you know, who actually started as a true freshman two years ago, but he got hurt. Um, so he's pushing for that job too. And also, you know, we got, uh, what's the kid's name? It's going to be Neto U. You know what I'm saying? Neto is nasty, physical blocker. He's one of those guys that you say, you know, if it's time to run the ball, you know, and it's on the one yard line and his goal line, who do I need to push the pile? And it's going to be Neto. You know, so Neto is, is a nasty guy. And from the first two practices here, you know, with full pads, he has been the guy that's, that's actually come out, you know, with the first team reps at left guard. Nick, we were talking USC football a few days ago, and they make no bones about it. They're going to the Big Ten. They got to get bigger, stronger. They just have to play that level of football and be able to take on that kind of four-quarter game. With Texas, is there truly any kind of transition to the SEC, or just they just keep doing what they're doing and say, hey, this is who we are, and it's good enough. Let's go. Keep doing what you're doing. Um, you know, so when Sark was hired here, you know, I think the, the uh, AD – you know, they understood that they were going to the SEC um, and they needed somebody who was going to come in and mold the team to be an SEC team. And, you know, Sark was the guy who worked at Bama, um, you know, so he brought his his guys with him that were at Bama, too, as well. You know, so Cal Flood being one of the best, you know, probably line coaches in the country. And he's built up the entire offensive line um, to where it was probably one of the best. Probably in the, I wouldn't say in the country last year, but definitely probably top top 15 in the country last year. I think next year for the SEC, they're going to be a top two or three line in the uh, the conference. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's just do what you keep doing. Sark wants a physical team. Um, you see it just up and down that line. I think the average weight for that, the uh, the line, you know, this year is going to be about 330 pounds. Um, so they're like an NFL caliber line um, with about probably three to four guys that will play on Sundays. And Nick, you know this better than I do. This uh, transition to the SEC comes at a good time because if this was two or three years ago, yeah, got I'm pummeled. not I'm not like a lot of people that just think <laughs> Texas would be embarrassed because I just think they had too much talent for that. But it wouldn't have looked good. They they wouldn't have been, you know, they, the, the record might have been a little rough. Yeah, I think maybe let's say three years ago is probably a six win team in the SEC because they just don't have the depth on the offensive line. Um, but this year um, and in last year, Sark has built a monster offensive line, defensive line. He's 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 done really well. Um, I think that they can stick with the big boys there. And and Texas showed, you know, just this past year going against Bama that they went, you know, into Bama and they dominated them on both sides of the line of scrimmage. And they pretty much did that for the entire season. Um, so, you know, uh, I don't have any problems with Texas going to the SEC. I think Sark is relishing this. I think he understands the SEC is going to be wide open this year. Um, you know, you got Georgia. Uh, you know, honestly, Bama's still going to be good as Bama, right? And, uh, but, you know, uh, other than those two teams and like Ole Miss, uh, it's it's wide open. And I think Texas sees that their talent level is just as good as anybody else in the conference. And they might actually make a shot at this and, you know, and hopefully go for it next year. And let's face it, Sark's been a, a, a coach at three major, major programs. Mm -hmm. And this is the first year he really pulled through. If you look at USC, that's a disappointment. Of course, yeah. the off the field issues could be. Uh, used there. Washington, his predecessor, his successor, both did a better job. So there was really nothing to I don't know about the predecessor. Coach. I'm sorry, what's that? You know, so Washington, I think people forget Washington was 0-12, you know, when Sark took over that team. You know, and, and by year four, he had him with nine wins. So that, that's a huge turnaround for like a four-year span. So, you know, that's that was one of the reasons he actually got the job, you know, in a in a Cali. But you know, you know, Cali was a was a bad situation for him. Um, but, um, you know, it's all about learning, you know, and just second chances. But I think Washington, I think people kind of, you know, see the final record and see that, you know, he was nine win guy. And, and but look, he took a team that won no games and he got them to nine wins within four years. So, no, it's a great point. Uh, what I was looking for there, Nick, is, you know, there were question marks concerning Steve Sarkeesian, uh, not about his offensive prowess or anything yeah. like that, but running a program. Mm -hmm. At what point were you convinced? What what was it a game? Was it a decision? Was there anything in particular that you were like, okay, I, I do believe he's the guy? Uh, first year, um, seeing that he was building the trenches up, 
You know, once I saw him go when he went full throttle, you know, for the offensive line and all the guys in, you know, Texas football and the podcasters and everybody who, you know, I talked to, we always say how much we missed on the big line guys, right? It was, you know, they're always going, they were going to AM, they they're going to Bama or, or, you know, Ole Miss, or they're going to LSU. We're losing a lot of guys that were in state, not coming to Texas. And Sark and Cal Flood, you know, got those guys to come to Texas. And that first year when Sark brought in seven offensive linemen in one class, I said, yeah, things are different. <laughs> you know, things are going to be different. And, you know, it paid dividends for us. Uh, you know, the first year, I think we won with just five games or so. But we saw the maturation process with these guys. And then once we got Quinn the next year and seeing what Quinn did is his, his first year, you know, the team went from five and seven to eight and four. And I'll tell you what, that line was 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 just starting to, you know, like build. And those were we had two guys who were freshmen starting on that line, and we, you know, and the team goes eight and four. And then the next year, you know, win the uh, Big 12, go to the college football playoffs, and you're seeing that these guys are starting to grow up in front of you, you know, Kelvin Banks Jr. and DJ Campbell. And we saw Christian Jones get an extra year, and he went from a guy that was not going to get drafted to a guy that developed, and now he's a top 150 prospect in the draft now. You, you know, so you're seeing that the staff can develop players. And so that's when I kind of figured out was that I would say like the second year once once we saw that those players from that, you know, the the uh, the, uh, the uh, last coaching staff, when they got developed, I was like, yeah, this is a great staff. And, you know, just give them about three or four years. Ole Miss can always score, but this 2024 edition may be the best under Lane Kiffin. Four seasons under Lane Kiffin. The Rebs have yet to score less than 33 points per game. They look to be extra explosive here. This fall, we got uh, Zach Morith on the line. The Rebel Walk joins Zach on a regular basis right there with the folks at uh, the Rebel Walk. Zach, how you doing today? I'm doing fantastic, Mark. How are you, man? I am doing well. Good to see Hi. you. Glad to have you back. Yeah, you too. Thank you for this. And it's always fun when the football team's supposed to be as good as Ole Miss is. And coming off a nice 11-2 and campaign with a big bowl win against Penn State. Of course. And, and it's always good to have the starting quarterback back when he's been as productive as Jackson Dart, who really yep. had a bit of a breakout season for him last year in regards to extra big plays downfield, limited the picks to five. Uh, yeah. Your thoughts about Jackson Dart moving forward? Yeah, I think Jackson, did, he took that next step forward last year, Mark, and he did a fantastic job in that transition because like you said, you mentioned the interceptions. That was kind of a problem his first year at Ole Miss. So he kind of limited that down uh, in his second season here. And moving forward, it's just kind of about putting the pieces around him to improve his stats even more. And I think Lane Kiffin has done exactly that. So it should be fun just to see what Jackson can do in his third year under a Lane Kiffin offense. Yeah, we see it there, 65% completion percentage yeah. and uh, may surprise some people with eight rushing touchdowns right yeah. there as well. So he can, uh, you know, break, contain, threaten the defense there. So those defensive backs don't want to turn their backs on him because if he sees an opening in the line of scrimmage, he can always, uh, you know, convert a third down. For sure. No, he that's one of the more underrated, underrated parts of his game, but. He did have a bit of a problem not sliding. He seems like he always wants to get that extra yard. And against Georgia, he kind of paid for it. Uh, one of their defensive linemen just basically knocked him over like it was nothing. And I, that kind of caused a bit of an ankle injury. Um, and then he had surgery over the ankle, I think, this offseason. So he's still kind of recovering. He's still he's practicing fully, but he's still taking those next steps to get fully healthy here in the spring, Mark. Lane Kiffin, a bit of a perfectionist, a stickler, especially on this side of the ball. Has there been anything that he has stated in regards to Jackson Dart getting even better and him wanting more out of him? Lane, he, you know, he's really complimented Jackson on kind of assembling the squad, Mark, more so the off-field stuff rather than the on-field over the off-season. He said he played a big part in returning, you know, wide receivers like Trey Harris and Jordan Watkins, who are two of his most productive guys this year tight end Caden Prescorn, and also in the recruitment of Juice Wells, who Ole Miss picked up from South Carolina. So it seems like Jackson's done a really good job, despite being injured, assembling this team. And then I do know over spring break, Jackson and a couple of the wide receivers went to California and trained with each other. So you can tell the intangibles are there. It's just going to be about 
getting him to full strength and seeing what he can do in his third season here. Then if we look at the uh, quarterback uh, backup situation, that is pretty plainly Walker Howard, I would think. Yeah, you right now it's probably Walker, Walker, excuse me, but Austin Simmons, as we all know, he's also playing baseball. So honestly, that's probably putting a little more stress on him than it needs to. So heading into the fall, I would probably go with Walker, but we'll see because Austin's very talented. Uh, he he's I believe he's 18 years old, maybe 19, super young kid, but you know he can do it all. Mark he obviously plays baseball, like I mentioned, but especially in the football field, he can run. His arm is extremely strong. He's very accurate. So that'll for sure be a quarterback battle next year. But I'm curious to see who's going to get that backup spot this year. But it does look like Walker Howard right now. Quinn Sean Judkins is a guy that broke out two years ago. Uh, I remember seeing him for the first time in an early SEC game in 2022 and thinking, I did not uh, really catch on to this guy in the recruiting process. Where did he come from? He right. wasn't that highly touted. Uh, hit a big 2022, scored 15 touchdowns last year. He's obviously taken his talents to Ohio State. I'm guessing that caused a bit of a stir. A little bit, Mark. You know, it was very controversial. People, obviously, there's rumors, there's message boards posting all these different things. I don't know the truth. I don't – it doesn't matter. He, he's playing for Ohio State next season. It is what it is. But like you said, it does cause a bit of a problem in the running back room. Uh, two of Ole Miss's running backs who were planning to start next year, Logan Diggs, who transferred from LSU, and Ulysses Bentley, who was the backup last year. They're both injured right now. So it's kind of – it's a bit of a problem. If there's a problem on this team, it's for sure the running back room. You can bet Lane Kiffin is going to get probably at least one, probably two running backs in the spring portal cycle. And one of those names that comes to mind is Henry Parrish uh, from Miami. He hit the portal a couple weeks ago. And he did used to play at Ole Miss under the same running backs coach that's here right now. We're talking uh, Rebels, and we're looking at the offense, and we got Zach Morth on the line from the Rebel Walk. Please join him right there. Subscribe right here. You like the video, so confirm that with the uh, like button as well. I got to tell you, Zach, two of the best catches that I saw in all of college football last year one, I don't want to screw this up because I'm almost positive. One was Dayton Wade. Yep. <laughs> and yeah. then the next week, or it was later in the game. I'm trying to think what game it was. It, it's either the Texas A&M game, and then it was the yeah. Georgia game the next week. And yep. I'm like, that's a different guy. How did they have two guys that could make catches like that? Then it was Trey Harris. Right. I'm like, good Lord, uh, two dudes <laughs> on the same team are – are, are capable of making that kind of catch. Uh, two of the best catches I saw all season. They were they were fantastic. And in that Georgia game, Ole Miss was getting pummeled at that point. So every, I was kind of tuning out already. And then you see Dayton make that catch, and I'm like, oh, my gosh. It, it was fantastic. But, you know, like you said, that wide receiver room, it's, it's going to be incredible. Dayton is trying to pursue the NFL, but that doesn't take away from the fact that Trey Harris is coming back. We, I talked about Juice Wells from South Carolina. He didn't play a whole lot last year, but the year before, he was a force for them. You know, he caught up for over 900 yards. Let me check here. Yeah, average 13 yards per catch. So, and he's 6'1, 210. He's not a slot guy. He's a bigger body and he can do it all, along with Jordan Watkins, who is your slot guy. Him and Dart are very close. Jordan's been here for two years. This will be his third year, just like Jackson. So he knows the offense well. And again, he's fast, great leader, and just a good person to have in the locker room, Mark. And, uh, of course, with what Lane Kiffin likes to do with his receivers and tight ends, uh, you can almost uh, put Caden Priestcorn into that category as well. He was yes. reliable with uh, 30 catches last year. Yeah, Priestcorn, it was interesting. People were really excited about Priestcorn. He's a great player. He came from Memphis, and then he had toe surgery, I believe, in the upcoming weeks leading up leading up to the season. So he didn't come back till week four. And he actually said in a press conference, he was kind of, he really wasn't even practicing at that time. He was just playing in the games and he was still really productive. You know, Kiffin's referred to him as an NFL type tight end who can block and get open in the middle of the field. We saw it in the peach bowl too. You know, he tore apart that Penn state defense. So 
when Caden's healthy full year round, I'm really looking forward to see the impact that he can make in this offense. All right, Zach, that's all the players that uh, people like to talk about. You can look at the numbers. You can talk about speed, you know, matchups, that sort of thing. But uh, it typically doesn't work if the guys up front don't block. So the offensive line, one of the most important units on on the field, of course. How does that set up for 2024? This is, again, another area that Kiffin and the staff just dominated in the portal. They went went and got a new tackle from North Carolina. Diego Pounds, I believe he was the second ranked offensive lineman in the portal. Just a really big guy, Mark. I, I've seen him in person. He's 6'7, 330. He looks like a guy you want to be protecting your quarterback. And then on the interior for the guards, Nate Kaleppo and Julius Bulow, two guards who transferred from Washington will be starting for Ole Miss next year. So as big as they are and as like ferocious as they are as linemen. They bring a level of experience of national championship game experience, which is a big thing for a team that's trying to pursue that goal. And then at center, Jackson will have the same center. His name's Caleb Warren. He's been super productive. Again, another voice, a great leader in that locker room. So if they can tie tie everyone together, get everyone on the same page, this could be a really productive offensive line, especially a line that's going to need to be productive with the question marks in the running back room right now. So, Zach, with all of that put together, what could possibly go wrong? I guess injuries aside. Right. You know, that's that's the question, Mark. And you kind of – we're going to have to play it by ear. I think a couple of those matchups that we're going to find things out quickly is on the road next year in Baton Rouge. And then, obviously, at home we have Oklahoma and Georgia. So, those are three make-or-break games that are kind of going to determine the fate of this Ole Miss team, especially on the offensive side of the football. Considering for a long, long time and going back way before your time, you know, this was a national championship type program in the 50s and early 60s. And then, and that was way before my time, believe it or not, too. And then (laughs) after that, you know, we're sitting in seven and five territory most of the next 40 or 50 years plus. And now Lane Kiffin takes over. And of course, Hugh Freeze had some nice seasons, but Mm -hmm. Lane Kiffin takes over. And he's posted a couple uh, 10 and 11 win seasons. And there's all this expectation for 2024. So this has to be something that uh, people have been waiting for for a long, long time. Absolutely, Mark. You know, I'm not a lifelong Ole Miss Miss fan. I'm just a freshman here. But I've fallen in love with the game and all the sports here. People who are Ole Miss fans lifelong, this is such a surreal moment for them. Just talking to them and walking around the Oxford community, walking around campus, people are excited. And I think we're still over 150 days away, but there, I will go on record and say there's never been this much buzz around an Ole Miss football season since probably, like you said, Mark, the 1950s and 60s. Culmination of a spring practice in Athens with the annual G-Day game. And uh, Georgia and Kirby Smart looking to get better for 2024. We got Anthony Dasher here, UGA Sports on Rivals. Anthony, appreciate you stopping by as always. Sure, Mark. Well, there's a quarterback situation that's uh, firmly entrenched. So no quarterback battle. Carson Beck's the guy. Uh, That's right. What's that? No, I said that's right. (laughs) No issue (laughs) there. So no quarterback battle to deal with. But as you look over the offense, What are the main questions? And we remind people this is one practice out of 15. Don't blow it out of proportion. But uh, what what are some of the main position battles on offense? You know, I don't know if it's so much position battles. uh, But as far as, you know, Carson is concerned, it's more about, you know, getting in sync with with some of these new receivers. And there's a, you know, good many of those guys, uh, you know, to talk about with the uh, the transfers, you know, that the Georgia, you know, brought in Colby Young. You know, London Humphreys and Michael Jackson, the third, and the two freshmen they've got. So it's been more about that than, than say, position battle. Now, you know, there are some obviously competitions going on, you know, up front of the offensive line. You know, both guard spots, uh, you know, Tate Rattler has one, but you've got Michael Morris and Dylan Fairchild, you know, competing to see which one of those guys may start uh, at, at, on the left side. And at right tackle, you've got Xavier Trust. But, you know, sophomore Monroe Freeland has been accounting for himself, you know, Know, quite well, but but otherwise, like I said, just more about, about building, you know, that continuity that you uh, are going to need uh, once the season starts to be as efficient as you can be. 
So on the defensive side, probably the secondary with the most questions at this point. Yeah, yeah, just because they're yeah, I think they're 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 so young and they don't maybe have not not have quite the depth that Kirby Smart would uh, like. I mean, you you got some like I said, you've got some freshmen who are competing who are in there too deep right now to be quite quite frank. I mean, Ellis Robinson the fourth is a you know, former five star guy that's really been impressive. Uh, he's going to play wide, right away. Uh, you know. You know, they just, that's just a, a group with uh, some of the ones they lost. They've got to get some guys back in there, but I think they'll be all right, you know, ultimately. So, Anthony, if we take the entirety of the spring, not just uh, what people are going to see on Saturday, but uh, the the other 14 practices and, and what intel that you have, what have been some of the major storylines? What's been improved? What's been worked on? Well, the defensive line has been a focus, not because they lost so much, but they want to get, want to get better. Uh, you know, I know some Georgia fans have been maybe a little bit concerned. I don't, you know, because because Coach Bart hadn't been raving about the group. But the problem, the problem is, it's, it's a good problem to have. They've been going against Georgia's offensive line, which may be one of the best in the country this year. But they want to see, I think, a little more depth to better at, at that spot. Uh, outside linebacker, you know, Chad Chambers is, is back, but they want to uh, see some more guys at that spot, you know, step up to to provide, uh, you know, a better pass rush. Inside linebacker, they're extremely deep, and that may be one of the better positions. You know, on the team, and of course, on back flipping back to the offense. Of course, there's no Brock Bowers anymore, so they've got to, you know, get the you know Oscar Delp uh, a little bit of help at that position as well. But you know, they've uh, got some good young players. They got the Stamper transfer, you know, coming in here. Uh, I believe going to get here get here next month, and so they'll fortify that spot, you know, as well. We are talking up Georgia football with Anthony Dasher. You can catch him on a regular basis at uh, UGA Sports on Rivals. It's ugasports.com. The G-Day game is coming up on Saturday. Uh, Anthony, when we look at recruiting and where it stands right now, you got six hard commits. Mm -hmm. A couple have come in just here in the last week or so with uh, an interior offensive lineman with Mason Short. And then also the guy that uh, many consider to be the best tight end in all of high school football right there out of Kingsland in Elias Williams, if I'm pronouncing his name correctly. Yeah. Elias has actually been committed for, for a little bit, but uh, he's a guy who physically, uh, you know, uh, six foot seven, about 200, and, uh, you know, 50 pounds right now is uh, one of the development to one of the top guys in the country. I know, but, but George is being pushed for him. I know he was at Miami over this past weekend. I know the hurricanes are, uh, you know, would really love, uh, you know, to have him. But he's, he's a, you know, would, would be just another, you know, one of those great tight ends that Georgia has had over the past, uh, you know, uh, recent years. People like to compare him to Darnell Washington from a couple of years ago, that same kind of a uh, frame and, and skill set. And you mentioned Mason Short, you know, former Alabama commit. You know, he decommitted once the coaching change uh, took place. And it came down to between Georgia and Clemson. And Mason's, uh, again, uh, you know, you know, a Georgia guy about an hour and a half away uh, from Athens, uh a uh, guy who can play tackle, can play guard, and, and uh, Georgia, I know, is very thrilled to have him. That's what uh, stumped me on the the Williams commitment was the year. Mm -hmm. uh, I saw April and whatever the date was. Mm -hmm. I thought that came in just in the, in no, the last, last year. That so, so yeah. That's been a year old. Yeah. There we go. But uh, Mason Short is coming in here in the last week or so yes. as well. Uh, I was kind of curious that uh, USC – of all schools, not that they don't know how to recruit there, but coming to Georgia and grabbing three players here mm -hmm. just in the last few weeks and three of the top five or ten players in the state. Yeah, Justin Terry, I guess, was the big one. Uh, I mean, a lot of this is about NIL. I mean, this is a new new era, new new day in college football, and, uh, and uh, Southern Cal has, uh, has some money to spend, and uh, I think that's been more of a – the uh, issue than maybe anything else. But again, George is not, uh, you know, giving up on, on Justin whatsoever. He's still coming back for a visit here. I think another couple of weeks, maybe months, something, something of that nature. So I wouldn't totally, you know, rule him out yet. You're going to see, I think a lot of these kids, not just Georgia, but across the country make early decisions and flip back. I mean, just again, NIL has really changed the game in, in college football. I'm not sure if it's for the best or not, but you know, way some of the you know guys are flipping around, but it's just the way it is right now. Let's get started uh, with the skill positions and your thoughts about what we may see on Saturday. Right. And as you said about Stoops just and, and steady now with, with Nick Saban's retirement, Stoops is the uh, the elder statesman in the SEC going on. This will be his 12th year now in, in Lexington. And, and as you said, starting, they're going to have a new a new quarterback, Brock Vandegrift, transferring from Georgia uh, here. And you talked about uh, Chip Trainum from Ohio State. 
Um, he's going to be your, your, your starting running back. Um, from everything I've seen and read, you know, Vandergriff has looked, has definitely looked the part of an SEC quarterback, um, you know, making, you know, making some, you know, making the, the throws that he needs to make, seeing a couple of videos um, the UK's, you know, media have posted, um, you know, throwing the, the deep balls to Dane Key, you know, he and Barry and Brown are, are, are back this year um, with another year and everybody's thinking that they're going to take that next step. Um, you know, they struggled at times as sophomores. You don't want to really call it a sophomore slump, but, you know, they did. It never seemed like last year that the receivers and Devin Leary were always on the same page. Now, for whatever reason, you know, then they had issues with drop balls. But but going back to Vandergriff, I mean, he's he's very, um, you know, he, he like I said, he looks he looks the part. He's doing everything that he's supposed to, uh, you know, that, that they're, they're expecting. Of course, UK has another a new offensive coordinator and a uh, Bush Hamden who came to Kentucky from Boise State. Um, some people a little surprised that he left Boise State because, um, you know, they they finished 2023 on a big on a big run, and they're likely, you know, whenever I get to probably Memorial Day weekend or somewhere in there, get to like some first bowl projections. I mean, I they're definitely going to be, you know, I, I think everyone's pick probably is a group of five team. But um, but if you're if you're counting at home, that's that's five different offensive coordinators in five years um, for um, for Kentucky. You go back to, to 2020 with Eddie Grand. Then you had Liam Cohen the first go around 2021. Uh, Rich Gangarello in 2022, then Liam Cohen 2.0 last year, and, and now uh, Bush Hamden this year. So, um, you know, they're having spending the spring working on a new system. From what from what we've seen and heard, um, he loves a lot of misdirection, a lot of um, I don't want to say gadgets, but you know, it's not just the straight you know line up in the line up and let's run the ball, you know, pass the ball, da da da, you know, all that. Um, there's a lot of a lot of intricacies and a lot of um, um, what's the word I'm looking for um, deceptions almost like in in, um, in in that offense. So I think it's going to be I think it's going to be something that, that, that the Big Blue Nation will be excited to see, and we'll get at least a taste of that on, on Saturday with um, with the spring game. It's only the second one I think since 2019. Obviously, COVID uh, wiped out a couple of those. A couple of years, Kentucky didn't have a game. And then last year, um, they were doing renovations at, at Kroger Field, so they didn't have a game. But um, like I said, this would be a lot of ch- people's first chance to see to see Vandegrift, see uh, Chip Tranium. Um, and uh, like I said, he's never been – he's never been – he was always the number two guy behind somewhere else at Ohio State. But when he ne- when they needed him to do something, you know, the, the Notre Dame game – Last year comes to mind. He's one that scored the touchdown um, late in the game to give Notre um, Ohio State the win. Uh, I mean, he looks again. He looks the part. He's ready to go. He's ready to be the man and, and take over uh, take over that running game. So that's that that's two. That's going to be two things that obviously people are going to be looking for uh, on Saturday as getting to see them in action for the first time. Now, Kevin, when you look at uh, both sides of the football in terms of position battles and uh, those question marks about who's going to emerge and take those spots. What, uh, and, and of course, this is not going to be the end all be all. We got to remind people this is just a big deal because people get to see it, but it's only one of 15 sessions and it only sets the stage for what's going to happen in August camp before the season. But, uh, what, what are the position battles that you think are the most fierce? Uh, right now, um, Probably one of the, um, the offensive one of the offensive tackle spots. Um, Kentucky's got four guys, four of their five starters back from last year. Uh, you got Marcus Cox, a tackle. Dylan Ray, he's probably your um, starting one of your starting guards. Eli Cox, at center, and and Jagger Burton at um, at one of the other guard positions. But that right tackle, you have Cortland Ford, who's a former transfer from USC. He's been hampered by injuries. He's out for the spring this year with an injury and a guy that is uh, uh, turning a lot of heads and um, <clears throat> excuse me, has been very, um, you know, has been running a lot with the first team is Gerald Mincy, who's a, uh, um, a transfer from Tennessee. So if, if that was that, that's one position that, um, that, that, that has been, um, 
you know, kind of watched kind of heavily in the spring. Um, the the third the third wide receiver, um, you've got you like I said you I mentioned him earlier, you got Barry Brown, you got Dane Keyback. Uh, a name to watch is Jamori Macklin, who's a, a transfer from um, from North Texas. Uh, he's most likely going to be the guy that replaces Tavion Robinson, who uh, had used up his college eligibility and is trying to will be trying to make it in the NFL. And Kentucky's brought in a bunch of guys through the uh, through the transfer portal. Um, Raymond Cottrell, who's from Texas A&M, um, Fred Ferrier, who's actually a Kentucky native. Um, you know, it came back here to Lexington this year. Um, so Kentucky uh, Vandergriff has got a whole bunch of weapons to um, to throw to. He's just got to, um, um, you know, it's just a matter of like the spring, just getting, um, you know, getting on the same page with everybody. Um, I, the defense, I mean, most of the guys, if you look at the defense, I mean, the the top six guys, the, the 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 last post that I did, I've been going through at last word doing like a position by position thing. We started with quarterbacks, did running backs, receivers, and the last one I did as the lineman. And if you look at Kentucky's defensive line, basically the top six guys from last year are all back. So um, you know you're you're pretty much too deep at at, at the three line positions and mo- most and it, it's that way mostly on the defense um the one new guy who's probably going to come in and start right away is a uh, you know Jamin Dumas Johnson for the the transfer from um from Georgia um he he's a guy that's going to come in and probably start from day 1 but for the most part um uh, a lot of the guys you know a, a lot of the positions seem set as I'm looking at it now obviously things and happen between now and then that you know people could transfer you know injuries you know you never want to you know you know speak of speak of injuries but you know obviously in football is a thing that can happen but um but like i said most for the most part i think a lot of the a lot of positions are pretty well set it's the one tackle position and then the third maybe the third wide receiver but like i said i think that's going to be that's going to be macklin um, um starting off so is there any talk about uh, what Kentucky may do in the transfer portal, which of course opens up uh, just a couple of days after Saturday's spring game, if they've got any particular needs they're targeting? I mean, I, I think they're always looking for guys. I, I would not be surprised if, if they could find a, a running back, um, another, you know, kind of mid-level, you know, guy who's played, played some running back just to have some extra experience because, a lot of the guys in Kentucky's quarter uh, running back room, you know, have been with the program for a while. You know, we have our our, our guy Demi, you know, Sumo Carnbe, um, who's basically you know going to be there with, with with training them as as a running back. But uh, uh, behind that, most of those guys don't have a ton of experience. I could see them going after a um, maybe after a running back. I could see them possibly going after a um, maybe another offensive lineman just as a uh, you know, just as a backup and maybe possibly uh, somewhere maybe on the defensive, maybe in the secondary. But um, I, I would say maybe maybe a running back that they could find, uh, you know, a running back who has some, you know, a lot of experience. Uh, that might be the, the one the one area you could uh, you could look for hitting for them hitting the portal. Kevin McGuffey, last word on college football, breaking down the cats for us. Big weekend at Kentucky. Do they put that uh, spring game together with the baseball series. Are there other activities going on on campus? I'm trying. I'm trying to remember if the UK baseball. Well, you know, Kingland is going on um, right now. The, the big uh, horse racing horse racing mecca of Kentucky. Um, but you know, the, the the ball game will be going on at the same time of um, that Kingland will be going on. Like King, racing usually starts at one o'clock, and the, the game, the football game, as it's going to be. Um, is going to be at one. I, I should mention uh, we talked about this before we started. Uh, Stoop said due to uh, like depleted numbers on the defensive line, they're not going to have a de facto spring game. It's going to be. Um, he said I have so many injured, you know, people out. I can't really line up the first team offense and the first team defense. It just wouldn't be fair. And he said it's also not going to be like full contact. He, he used the phrase thudding. Um, I, I'm guessing that means, you know, you just make contact and wrap somebody up. Thudding. Mark Stoops did not make this up. This is in the dictionary. The action of moving, falling, or striking something with a dull, heavy sound. There you go. 
So I guess it's like I said, I guess it's maybe, you know, the art of, you know, hitting somebody but not actually tackling. So there there we go. See, we've learned something, you know, learned something new today. So courtesy <laughs> Mark Stoops. And yes. we're gonna learn a whole lot about John Calipari here in the next few days as well. So right, we'll follow right, that yeah. saga as yeah. well as everyone in big blue country there. Yep. So we'll like I said, we'll see what happens. But uh, one thing we do know is that, that Mark Stoops is still here. So, <laughs> and he's the elder statement, as I said earlier, now in the SEC with uh, with um, Saban, you know, with, with Saban's retirement. So, I mean, 12, 12 years, like I said, you can't get more, as you, you said in the beginning, you know, more more state, you know, stability with that football program. That's uh, that's where we are right now. So. The A-Day game, not to be confused with that other A-Day game. I don't know why these two schools do this, because you would never want to confuse anything with that other <laughs> school if you are an Auburn fan. And we are surrounded by Auburn right now, of course. We have gone to the source here. Kyle Loomis, E2C Network. It's everything Auburn you would ever want. You check in with Kyle and everyone there at E2C Network. Kyle, appreciate you stopping by. Thanks for having me on. I'm excited to talk about A-Day. And you're right. Uh, it, seems, it seems we could come up with maybe something different. You know, Auburn and Alabama never fight over anything. So why would either give any ground on taking over the A-Day name? It's just in our nature to have an argument with each other about something. Well, at least they weren't played on the same day. That, that's fair. And that has happened before, I believe, maybe once or twice. And so that can get a little bit, I won't say challenging, but confusing, especially for marketing and stuff like that. But that day, this past week and a beautiful day, it was all Auburn on a day. So the setup, of course, was that the defense was spotted a 27 to nothing lead. Now, mm -hmm. that's kind of dicey. They can't score. You know, anyway, what whatever your scoring yes. metric or what do you think of that? I would say that that is a pretty fair assessment of game situations, high scoring um, expectation of college football games these days mm -hmm. and saying, OK, we want you to limit the offense to less than four touchdowns. Can you get this done? Can yeah. you hold this lead? So it's yeah. sad at 27 and nothing. But when, uh, yes, the aforementioned Towns Magoo hit on not just the game winning field goal, but his seventh of the day to bring home the game winner at 28 to 27, at least provided a little drama for a day. Yeah. You hit it on the, on the head there. The format I really like uh, with putting pressure on both the offense and defense, hold them, get to this point. It works really well for an eight day format. So I'm, I'm glad we're continuing with that under freeze. And hopefully everybody sees the value in that, but boy, if you're going to talk about something on the day, there are several things we can discuss, but if I told you previously that you need to be watching Towns Magoo, the backup kicker in a day to be excited about, I, I don't know. I would have been crazy. Uh, this was interesting enough to see that we had to attempt that many field goals seven for seven. And can I just remind folks that the you know starting kicker who's nursing an injury right now, Alec McPherson, he is a hundred percent last season too. So just think about that. Never before has Auburn seen quite such a talent in the depth chart on kicker, but this guy not only is locked in, in his hometown team, he's from Auburn, Alabama, knocks every one of them down, but under pressure to get the offense, to win 58 yards. And I'm going to tell you, witnessing this in person, I believe it would have gone for 60 65 now whether he would have been accurate is the question because from my angle you know it's hard to tell where the where it lined up i couldn't see the tv version of it but boy that thing had some distance he's the story of the day and interestingly enough i didn't think we'd be talking about that all right cam coleman you were not the story of the day but uh, you can blame that on one uh <laughs> towns magoo but otherwise, looking ahead to what is expected out of the 2024 season, Cam Coleman would maybe have a little more yeah. uh, staying power. Yeah, you're 100% right here. As much as we're having fun with this kicker storyline, which is a, is a good thing to see that we're that deep there. Let's not kid ourselves here, folks. Since the day that Cam Coleman committed and signed to Auburn, it has been the Cam Coleman show in the Auburn fan collective's mind. From the get go, I've been one that's been very much pushing the caution button of let's let this kid get here. Let's see how he does against actual college talent and not just high school talent. And you can still make the case it's a spring game, right? You're playing against each other. It's it's quote unquote for real. 
But boy, he's making it real hard for me to push the caution button anymore. Um, the kid just comes out there. Not only does he get to go out with the first group, if you want to call it the quote unquote, the first group and shows out right away. I mean, gets a, a very good, I would say some people say it was overthrown, but from Hank Brown, a ball that puts it into his catch radius, which is a very big one, uh, for a bomb early in the game. And then he connects with Peyton Thorne on what some would say is an underthrown ball. But again, I'll make the case maybe there was a little bit, bit of miscommunication there. It doesn't matter, though. He still makes the play and makes his way into the end zone uh, with a guy on him. Um, he looks every bit the part of it. And and believe it or not, there's still some other good wide receiver things to talk about there, too. But we got to be honest, Cam Coleman, so far, he looks legit. So that's going to make it a whole lot easier on what everyone expects to be a Peyton Thorne led offense. When you've got that kind of guy that if you just throw it in the vicinity, uh, he's going to pull it down or he's going to gain better separation than most wide receivers. So that's uh, of course uh, a welcome to Hugh Freeze's yeah, pass offense that was rated so low last year, but uh, yes. moving on to the, the quarterbacks themselves, what's your assessment of how they showed up on Saturday? I mean, the assessment hasn't changed at all. Uh, it's still Peyton Thorne's job to lose. Coach has said as much beforehand. I believe he echoed similar sentiments afterward, if I'm not mistaken. And if you look at the how the performances went, it'll show you that the best of the day overall was Peyton Thorne. Now, you could make a case that maybe each quarterback did something a little bit better in different areas. As we talk about hype around players, Walker White, the new recruit coming in, has all the hype. You know, the, those that choose to look at the grass is greener is always greener on the other side, always believe that this new five star, four star is coming in is going to be the next best thing. He struggled a little bit at times. And I could see, at least from my vantage point in the stadium, what looked like some frustration and wanting, frustrated himself for wanting to do better. But he's still a young kid. He's going to take some time to get used to this. Um, he's kind of working the same format that Peyton Thorne did last year with even a little bit more time than Peyton Thorne did, just trying to learn this new system. Peyton Thorne, on the other hand, I saw not just taking care of business, but what I liked was his – he acted like a general out there on the field. Very early on, you saw a couple wide receivers out of alignment – uh, not motioning when they were supposed to, and he's getting on their butts and getting these guys in the position. You got to know that your quarterback out there is the general on the field. And so that's what I liked, what I saw out of him, that if you want to talk about what impressed me, his command of the field seemed to impress me. He used his leg again as much as you can in a spring game where you're not tackling your quarterbacks. You also saw him you know, sling the ball down the field a few times, work it across the field. Was it a overly impressive day where you go, Oh, Peyton Thorne's clearly, clearly the best thing that's ever happened. Absolutely not. But to say that it's the same old thing, to say he didn't do well, is not being genuine either. The other two, Hank Brown showed his his athleticism yet again, uh, which I really love to see out there. And I think the most quote-unquote efficient would have been Holden Garner, who I believe was 7 for 10 on the day. Um, but it wasn't super exciting for him now if i'm forgetting something auburn fans and you're watching of course that's just my assessment what i saw out there on the field but the story is wrapping that up is peyton thorns your starting quarterback and it's not going to change at least for now so this uh spring game situation for any team in the country gets more attention because of course people can actually see it but the reminder is it's one of 15 and unless the coaching staff is putting certain things in play for these players that they haven't in other practices, they're basically, it's, it's one fifteenth of the slice. It's, it's just that slice mm -hmm. of about do the math seven or 8% of all of spring practice. So let's yes. keep that in mind. Absolutely. But as it stands, based on what you saw on Saturday, based on what you know, of the rest of spring practice mm -hmm. as we take this and now move through the off season, off season, conditioning workouts, individual workouts into August. Mm -hmm. What are those position battles and questions that have to be answered? Well, first and foremost, it's the defensive line, the interior, the defensive line. Uh, you may be able to make the case that they had a great day because the running game was very pedestrian, but I think that somewhat was by design. Jarquez only, only got about four carries on the day for zero yards. Uh, so you're not going to get a lot of exciting things out of the running game. But coach has said this before, has said this after, we have to get more bodies, especially interior defensive line. And so I think that's where you're going to see a need being addressed very quickly. 
and most obviously. What are the, the position battles that we start looking at? We're still waiting on some of these other young wide receivers to enter into the fold. What a class it was uh, this past year, 2024 for Auburn. How do they factor into the mix with Cam Coleman clearly making his case to be in for some starting time, if just significant playing time, if not starting playing time? Will they push others out? Does Robert Lewis, who was a very nice surprise as a wide receiver, a seasoned wide receiver coming from Georgia State, does he continue to push for more playing time? So that's going to be interesting there. As I've kind of said with the quarterbacks, I don't think there's going to be a lot of change there, although I think some fans would want to see that. The other thing defensive backs where do these players find themselves in a position group that has opened up significantly because we lost all this talent either transfers or to mostly to the nfl draft i mean that entire group the starters the big talent is a is gone so who fills in those spots you've got a couple of things like a k and lee who did very well on a day who uh, has got his spot locked down, but who's going to fill in that star position, that safety position? Um, that's the biggest questions for me. And I, of course you can address some of those in the transfer portal, but I think most of that's going to be addressed with who we already have here. All right. <laughs> I'm sorry, Kyle. It's okay. Nothing in my throat. That's okay. I figured you might need to. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh... Yeah, that's all I've got in the spring game, unless you have anything else. I was going to ask a very general recruiting question. Yeah. Um, not about any particular players, but just about how it's going and all that. I don't have any. I think we hit the high points, Cam Coleman quarterbacks, and then the, the kicking. So I think that's probably the most important things to hit in spring game-wise. All right. Folks, please hit the like button and subscribe right here at the Voice of College Football. Head on over to E2C Network. And Kyle's got the latest on Auburn athletics and the Auburn community as a whole over there on E2C Network. I'm looking at nine hard commits. Yep. Uh, the, the most recent is an interior offensive lineman, Ty Buster from North Carolina. Five, four stars, three of those ranked in the top 100. Mm -hmm. So off to a good start. Of course, May and June become crucial. A lot of camps, a lot of visits, mm -hmm. uh, weekend visits. And then we start to typically see more commits come in during the latter portion of the summer. So what's your assessment of the Hugh Freeze uh, 2025 class at this point? Well, I think it depends on who you talk to. If you talk to some people, they're panicking because we've had some flips. In fact, we've had one flip. I Cam, Col uh, not Cam Coleman, Antonio Coleman, so many Coleman's there, uh, that flipped from Alabama to Auburn back to Alabama uh, after Kalen DeBoer got in there and settled in. So there's, there's been a few of those things. A lot of this is in relation to our defensive line coach getting a promotion of sorts to go up to the NFL level and having to replace him. We promoted within to, uh, Von Trell King Williams, which was very much deserved in my opinion. Um, so if you talk to some people, there's a little bit of panic about that because there's not as been as much excited. I mean, how do you anti up the ante uh when you have a wide receiver class for instance like you had last year the focus has got to be offensive line and defensive line we, we talked about bringing in transfers and that's part of this discussion too but i'm really excited to start seeing where dj durkin can start paying off some of these dividends that began today or this weekend with a day a lot of people get disappointed if they don't see the commitment on a day or the day after but that's where you plant the seed. That's where they see how much fun it is to be around Auburn people, the Auburn family, to see what the facilities are like, all that stuff. So those dividends will be paid much later. I'm just focused on how we can continue to further our wide, uh, excuse me, our offensive line recruiting. You talked, you brought up Buster. That's a good start or a good continuation of what's already been there. There are some more out there that we probably really need to prioritize because the reality is, is, Auburn's got a really good group, I think, of young-ish guys that are starting to come along, but you need to start building up that next group of offensive linemen. Because if you don't, you will end up exactly what you and you and I will be having the same conversation every single, however often we get together. Auburn's offensive line is terrible. <laughs> we have got to make that a priority. And then on the same token, DJ Dirk and building up that defensive line is a game of inches you got to win it there. We know you're excited to head back to spring practice, get on the field, check out the guys in person. And based on what you're telling me going into this conversation, you're going to see a whole lot of Taylor Green working with the ones. 
And I don't know how to interpret this exactly because he was good enough to be the starter at a Boise State team that won the Mountain West Conference. The stats are not overwhelming, but again, he led them to a conference championship. He's mobile, and uh, he presents that dynamic. But with Jacoby Criswell, knowing the offense as well as he should and being around campus and terminology and everything should not be an issue there, that uh, I don't know if that's a good thing in regards to saying, okay, Taylor Green must be that good, or really there's not a quarterback battle? Maybe a little bit of both. Um, I, I so yeah. I mean, it is it is new terminology. To be fair, it is Petrino's uh, first year back. <laughs> it's still it's still wild to say out loud. By the way, as I think I mentioned last time I was on here, but uh, it is new terminology. And Green was his guy, and I believe he recruited him when he was at um, Missouri State. Um, and, you know, I, I guess he just kind of fits the mold for, for what Petrino wants to do. He is, uh, like you said, he's, he's mobile. He can, he can throw the ball. You know, Pittman talked about his leadership being his, his greatest strength. Uh, it does seem like, yeah, uh, you know, the players, the players do like being around him. And one of the, one of the things that you do, at least from what the university shows the public, you know, via Twitter, you know, their little videos that they upload. I think maybe Hogs Plus has done a little bit here and there. Um, it, they they show a lot of camaraderie between Green and, and the rest of his, you know, his receivers and whatever, kind of clown and having a good time. We didn't really see that from KJ. And to be fair, that was – KJ was always kind of quiet and kept to himself. I hate how people weaponize that against KJ. Like, oh, well – that's why he was so terrible last year. Never mind they had the worst offensive line, maybe even worse than the Chad Morris era. Uh, never mind that. If you notice, nobody had success in that backfield, including the running backs or Jacoby Criswell at the end of the year. Um, but that's the one thing that stands out that's different about Talon. I don't know if he, you know, they're able to work with these players a little bit more, it sounds like, in the offseason. And maybe there's something there and, and Green and Pittman and, Petrino just all are are on the same page and, and the rest of these guys are still trying to understand the verbiage and the vernacular of the offense uh but right now yeah it's it's greens it he's been with the ones from day one I mean he's he's been he's been the guy I've not seen anyone else take any reps with the ones it, it's been him and as far as I could tell unless I and I haven't missed a day of practice yet in spring camp I haven't seen anyone else take those reps and then um that is that is a little bit surprising because I thought we would see a very in-depth battle. And in fact, not only is does it appear that Jacoby Criswell or that Green is number one, it's almost like Criswell is now fighting for the number two spot along with uh, Malachi Singleton, the redshirt freshman. Taylor Green over the last two years has rushed for over 1,000 yards total in those two seasons with 19 rushing touchdowns. Now I'm going to bring to light Statistically, now we don't know what the situation was with the offensive line at Boise State from 2022 to 23, yeah. or if he had better wide receivers in 22 than in 23. But for a quarterback who was a freshman starting at Boise State, and then he goes to his uh, redshirt sophomore season, it appears to be, he goes from 61% completion percentage to 57 he goes from 14 touchdowns and six picks to 11 TDs and nine picks. That's not usually the type of progression that you see from freshman year to sophomore year for a quarterback who has started and played and thrown over 500 passes now that those numbers took a bit of a hit last year. Again, not understanding the context. I watched Boise State play a little bit here and there, but it wasn't like I was dissecting their offensive line play or wide receiver play. Yeah, I, I don't fully, you know, I to me, because it's a new situation at the University of Arkansas, I do look at those numbers and those are concerning. I mean, like you said, 61, almost 61 and a half percent completion percentage in 22 drops all the way down to barely 57 percent with with three more picks. And uh, f I think, would you say two or three less touchdowns thrown? Um, but he does take the starting job back towards the end of the year. They, they had a weird two quarterback situation going on at Boise State. 
I don't know all the ins and outs of it. I reached out to someone who is a Boise State. Uh, he's a diehard fan. He's He had a uh, – I guess he works in the media. I don't know. Someone pointed me to him, and I reached out to him, and he never got back to me. But I, I would love to know exactly, you know, more details than just what the media – around it have been talking about maybe someone who who's a diehard Boise State fan uh those do exist by the way I know there's gonna be some hog fan like what are you talking about those people exist of course they do they've had a really good really good last uh, couple decades of football let's be fair but he was yeah I mean he he started off really well in fact I talked with Stephen Hamner QB spotlight about his progression and he said you know he did kind of stand out to me after his redshirt freshman year as someone who was who is progressing to be a potential like all conference caliber quarterback who probably won't be at Boise state very long. And he said, I don't know really what happened in 2023, but something obviously negative happened and it affected what was going on. I know they had some coaching changes and some things going on there, but as far as his on play, what I've seen, what Stephen Hamner's seen, I don't want to speak on behalf of Stephen Hamner, so I won't do that, but, uh, from what I've seen, I, I don't know. There's, there is a little bit of a regression there. And obviously, like you said, there's probably more that meets the eye with that whole thing. But, um, yeah, I, I hope with, with this day and age with the transfer portal and we know now it's, it's like control alt delete now, like you could just wipe away, you know, when you go from one team to another, that's essentially what you're doing. And you could do that with your roster control alt delete. We're going to reset the whole thing. We've seen how that's affected basketball and even baseball and, uh, of course, football. But that's not – that's what's interesting about this scenario is that, yeah, they don't have Rocket Sanders. Obviously, KJ's moved on. But really, everyone else is back outside of the offensive line. I'm talking about his weapons, right? Um, you've got most everyone back. Now, Green did – the running back did transfer. The running back, uh, A.J. Green, did transfer. But you've got – all the other running backs back. I mean, hell, even Johnson's back. Uh, Dominion's back. They've got, uh, you know, and they do have some new faces. Braylon Russell's going to be back there. Jackson from from um, Utah running back. You and I talked about him last time I was on the show. So they do have new faces, but then you look at the wideouts. Like, they're all back. The tight ends, they're all back so far. Now, we'll see what happens after spring camp. So, really, it's for green, it's like, control alt delete he's now on this new on this roster that's completely different but with a lot of the same faces back from a year ago but then you have you know Petrino the like we mentioned a minute ago a whole new offense so it's very a lot of different moving parts happening and that's it's that way everywhere I get it but for Arkansas fans it's a lot of different you know moving parts we talk about no rocket no KJ no AJ Green you know, but again, you're going to have some of these other guys back that are weapons, your, your, uh, your, your receivers and running backs. And then you've got this whole new offensive line, a lot of changes. And yet a lot of the things, some of the things remain the same, especially at wide out from what I could tell. I mean, AJ green or excuse me, tail green looks comfortable. I've not, I don't know that there's been a practice where I, I can remember last year watching Jacoby Criswell and Malachi they looked like deer in headlights, you know, and I'm talking early on spring camp. It took them, I don't know, to like practice eight or nine to where you really started to see them get comfortable. Now I'm, I've, that's the first ever spring camp I've ever been to, um, at least since I've been doing this. And so maybe that's new I'm just, or uh, old, you know, old news. That's something that happens all the time when you got these new faces, especially a freshman and a transfer. Um, but it, it was I could tell they looked like me really when I walked into spring camp, like they kind of looking around like this is, this is different. I've never got that with Taylor green. Taylor green has looked comfortable since day one. And I, I'm not saying that that means he's going to be dynamic. He's going to be an all conference quarterback. I'm not saying that, but I do think he's got a little bit of a, a head start. And that might be why the guy has been with the ones since day one. I, I think it probably has more to do with Petrino. I think Petrino, this is his guy, but I certainly believe that, being comfortable allows you to do a lot more, you know, with your skill set, right? I know as a content creator, the more comfortable I get, the better I feel like I am at my job and what I do. I'm sure you can relate to that. I think that's part of what's going on with Taylor. He's never looked like a deer in headlights. He's always looked pretty comfortable. And he, as far as I can tell, he's getting along with the staff. We know there's a lot more behind closed doors. But uh, as far as I can tell, he's comfortable. He looks pretty fluid. Has he made mistakes? Yes. Has he made some outstanding plays? Yes. 
too early to say one way or another, but um, I, again, I will say he's, he's looked, he's looked the part at the very least. To his defense, statistically, he started the first five games. He was under 48% the first two games. So the percentage mm -hmm. did go markedly up. He did throw three interceptions in the first two games. So he got better taking care of the football. But after starting those first five games, he obviously got benched because mm -hmm. he was playing in all these games. Uh, after that, in the next five games, he's playing. He's throwing six or eight passes. So he's coming in at some point in the game. Uh, but he's not starting. And then yeah. he starts at the end of the season. I don't know if uh, that would have been Hank Bachmeyer, I believe, was the other quarterback. Maybe not. Um, so I don't know if um, he took the job back over. There was an injury. But then they they win the Mountain West Conference. He plays the championship game, and he wins a bowl game. So there you go. Yeah. And he, he, he won it, and he was the MVP of the game. Uh, the, the conference championship game. The conference championship game. Yeah. Actually, I screwed up on the bowl game. I was looking at uh, the last game here against uh, UNLV. I was figuring they would have the last game as the bowl game. He must have uh, hit the transfer portal, did not play the bowl game. Yeah, he didn't he play lost that game. to UCLA. Yeah, but he, he, yeah, he played against uh, UNLV and looked the part. Now, I, to be fair, UNLV, UNLV's defense was not very good, and I know that's the thing that people pointed out to me when I mentioned – Look how great, you know, Taylor Green performed. Someone will fire back with, okay, yeah, it was Barry Odom, but it was a typical Barry Odom defense. It wasn't very good. So I, I don't know. I mean, I will say I've watched I've watched those highlights, and you and I, I know how you feel about highlights. You know how I feel about highlights. You know, everyone looks great in highlights, but he certainly, I mean, he looked the part, man. I mean, he, he looked more than capable, and I know that had to stand out to Petrino as a guy who recruited him and now he's seeing it happen, you know, his third year, technically his redshirt sophomore year, but his third year uh, in college football. And to see that, uh, clearly that's someone who Petrino believes can be the guy. Now we'll see it by the end of spring camp if Criswell or Malachi uh, Singleton, if they haven't pushed the issue, maybe they get some reps with the ones. We'll see how that unfolds. But yeah, again, so far it is it's Green's job to lose as far as I'm concerned, or at least as far as I can see, I should say. All right, everyone. Tusk Talk with Ty. It's right here on YouTube. So you're just a click away. Join Ty. He's going to be at all the spring practices. Good stuff to catch up with with Ty. Uh Ty, as always, you're our go-to guy when it comes to the hogs. Appreciate you being here. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me on. All right. I'll just cut that there. We'll go to the D. Okay. Here we go. I was looking for my okay. Let's break down those hogs. We got Ty Hudson here from Tusk Talk with Ty. It's right here on YouTube. Please uh, check that out. And of course, like the video here at the Voice of College Football and subscribe. Ty, what's going on? What's going on, Mark? Good to have you here as always. Good to see you. Glad everything's going well. And know that you're revved up to get back out to spring practice. Enjoy seeing the guys on the practice field. It's nothing like you're on the grass, nice, decent day of football, see the guys popping pads and knowing that, uh, yeah, I always love that too. It's been forever since I've gone out to those practices, but I used to have that regular run at Alabama, Mississippi State, and Ole Miss checking out spring practice, and that that's a good time. Yeah, I enjoy it. This is my second year to do spring camp. I've this if Assuming I'm – able to i'll be going to the fall camp as well that'll be my third fall camp but um yeah I, I i'm looking forward to it it's it's nice to have that kind of access and not everyone gets it i get that you know not everyone gets that kind of access so it's really cool and it's a lot of fun you kind of you know i did i played high school ball for a little bit so it is fun like when you're kind of roaming the sidelines and you all of a sudden you look around and you're in the middle of of what's seemingly the the sideline camaraderie with all the players and you're like, Oh, excuse me. Let me make my way through here. I'm just a fat bearded guy trying to get the scoop, trying to get the video. That's really what I'm there to do is, is to watch obviously to, you know, see what I'm seeing and then to get some cool video footage to upload to Twitter and YouTube. But it's, it is cool. It's, it is a lot of fun. It is. I don't view it as work. You know, uh, I'll have someone will say like, Oh, have fun at work today. When I go to spring camp, I'm like, yeah, it's not really work to me. It's, I mean, it is, but it's, it's a lot of fun. And, it's cool because you're down there on the ground. You can hear the coaches 
yelling all kinds of obscenities. And and uh, what's really neat too, I think something you don't get versus like reading it online, you do see how players and coaches interact and you hear it. You know, we're not far. I mean, literally, you have to watch out. You'll get ran over when they're doing uh, when they're doing step stepping drills or, you know, whatever, sideline drills, whatever they're working on. You got to be careful. And you could hear and see the coaches and the players, how they interact with one another. And it is interesting to see some of the changes, you know, with the coaching staff and, and the players and just how they interact with one another. That's something you don't get when you're reading or when you hear other people talk about it. It's like, yeah, they could talk about it. But how many of them are actually there? They get to they get to see it. It's it's uh, it's really a lot of fun. And I have I have almost been taken out before by a sideline throw. I I was down at my phone trying to type notes. I look up, and here comes uh, I forget who the players were, but I just kind of make eye contact with them, and I'm like, oh crap, I'm about to get killed. Luckily, they stepped, pivoted, and moved, and kind of twirled out before they ran me over. But uh, that's the only downside is you got to be careful. You can get taken out if you're if you're not uh, keeping your head up. Yeah, I used to experience the same thing, and you don't realize until you get accustomed to it. When you get locked in on that camera, like you're blocking out the rest of the world, you're just focused on, and all of a sudden yep. there might be a shoulder pad about three inches away. Yeah, yeah. Someone someone caught that moment that I'm talking about, and they sent it to me. I guess one of the U of A, one of the Arkansas, I don't know if it was, maybe it was Hogs Plus, maybe it was the U of A Twitter. I don't know, but they caught the throw or the catch in what happened. And you see me, I stand out. I'm, you know, I'm 6'3 and, you know, just fat. I'll just say it. I'm 6'3 and I'm fat. So I stand out and I'm wearing a pretty, I think I'm wearing a pretty bright shirt like I am here. And you can see, like, I'm kind of like, oh, no. You know? It's it's kind of wild. But, yeah, I've, I've heard stories of media people getting absolutely taken out. So you got to be careful. And we've seen it on TV. If you've watched, the, you know, any college or NFL game, you see sideline people get knocked out. Just got to be careful. Well, the Arkansas defense is going to try to lay some hits on some folks coming up this year. They were 47th in total defense, which out of 133 teams, not bad. I took a little deeper dive, though, and when you go into some of the metrics, maybe not quite as good as that overall number. 69th in yards per play against, 94th in pass efficiency against, which is the number I go to because pass yardage, you know, the, the teams that are winning games are giving up pass yardage because everybody's behind that's playing yeah. them kind of thing. So I think the pass efficiency stat is is uh, relevant at 94th and 76th in average yards per rushing attempt. So yeah. a middling defensive effort uh, last season. Uh, we'll get going on the defensive line and just your impressions about the defense coming into 24. Yeah, they still... <sighs> I have a lot of work to do. You know, they've got, I think they have five or six roster spots or scholarships left open. And I hope that they use it on, I mean, yeah, if it were up to me, I'd probably go, you know, three more interior defensive linemen and maybe another linebacker or two. And I know they're targeting some linemen on the uh, offensive line. I'm not, I'm not really sold on the defensive line at the moment. And it's not much, you know, we've had one full pad practice so far. I don't know what their plan is for uh, the 26th. I don't know. I'm assuming they're probably not going to be full pads on their first day back from spring uh, break. But uh, there's, there's, when you talk about bodies and overall talent, I, I don't know that they have it in the interior now outside. Yeah. They've got two or three guys. Obviously Jackson comes to mind when you, when you think of, probably a first or second team all sec guy maybe even a all-american candidacy uh especially when we talk about the amount of players that are leaving thanks to the uh you know guys declaring early and whatnot and and moving around to new places landon jackson is someone who probably stands out for most people when you're when you look at the sec and then they got anton jukage junkaj this uh transfer I forget what school he's from. I thought I had it pulled up and I don't. Uh, okay. Yeah, that's right. U of A Albany. That's right. Or, or university of Albany. That's right. Uh, I know he was highly, highly sought after four star transfer guy. Um, you know, someone they've got a lot of hope for. 
And to be honest with you, he's not. I don't know that he is that he's the number one guy at that other end spot. That's probably going to go to Nico Davier, uh, who's going into his. I think this is his junior season, if I remember correctly. They've got so much work to do on the defensive line. They lost a lot of people. Um, John Morgan and Jeff Coat, Trajan Jeff Coat, kind of stand out there, especially Jeff Coat, uh, along with some others. I know they have uh, Eric Gregory back, Cam Ball, Kyvy Rose. So far, still here. And then Ian Giffard, who's a redshirt freshman. They've got some names that you can kind of throw around, but there's no one that you – I don't know that there's anyone on this defensive line that you really know what you're going to get out of outside of maybe a cam ball. So a lot of questions with the interior defensive line spot. So I would probably use at least two or three of those scholarships that they have available. It's I think it's six. I'd probably use half that on the defensive line, whether it's interior, maybe try and find another pass rush guy if you can. I think that's going to be an area of concern for me is the defensive line. Uh, no one's really stood out, but it's hard to in spring camp. You know that. Uh, it's hard to stand out, especially on the line of scrimmage. It's really hard to stand out. Um, so not much to report there. Linebackers, though, I can say, although that's another area of concern. Sorry, there's a diesel truck just flying by. Uh the linebackers, that is an area of concern. I know there's a number of people who believe that they should just spend all their scholarships at the linebacker spot, and I, I don't know that I would argue with them too much. Uh, but Sanford has been a guy, Alex Sanford, who right now is probably working his way up to the twos. Uh, he's technically, I believe he's a redshirt freshman, if I'm not mistaken. I could be wrong about that. Pretty sure he's a – actually, I can just look here. I've got the roster. But anyways, he is someone that has stood out. He's made a couple plays in the backfield. He's had some – pretty good moments through spring camp and he's someone who i thought okay no u of a says he's a sophomore okay 6'1 226 yeah they got him out of oxford mississippi had some pretty good offers out of high school but he he's kind of looked the part through spring camp but he's someone i thought last year uh who had a couple of decent moments i can remember in practice thinking boy he's gonna work his way up to the twos or ones by the end of this season and now here we are fast forward to this year and he he is with the twos he could press to work with the ones he could be a guy either a situational guy or someone who might have a shot between him and probably brad spence the other linebacker the other sophomore linebacker you know it's going to be a bit of a battle i think between those two so uh Xavier sorry is the mike who'll end up playing the mike i don't know who's going to be behind him uh, i think right now i have uh, i have to scroll down on my sheet here i think i have well, I've got a couple of guys there that could that could possibly press for that spot, one of them being Carson Dean. Um, Dean's a pretty good player, had a very early last last year fall camp, had a really good beginning of fall camp, if I remember correctly, um, who I thought would also maybe make the three deep last year, and he didn't. I don't think he did. Uh, but Carson Dean's kind of in that mix. But the linebacker room, I do believe they could probably use some some more bodies there. But there's guys making plays, and uh, I have in my notes here, uh, let's see, Alex Sanford has had at least two or three big plays during 11-on-11 full pads, the one and only day we had full pads, one of which was a monster stop in the backfield versus incoming star-studded freshman running back Braylon Russell, who's a big back, by the way. Tree trunk legs, built like a, I don't know, like a muscular Dr. Pepper bottle. (laughs) If that makes any sense, uh, he's just, he's built and he's got those from the waist down. He's just, he's pretty thick. He's pretty built. Him and Johnson have that in common. Uh, and he made Sanford made a hell of a play stopping him in the backfield. Everybody saw it and it was great. Uh, he's also broken up a few, pla- a few passes, you know, whether it be full pads or earlier in pre- uh, camp when they weren't full pads, he seems to be a pretty effective, whether it's in the pass or in the run so far, linebacker, maybe one of the more active linebackers that I've seen. Um, and also, to be fair, I probably should have said this at the beginning, I've only really spent half of a day kind of watching the defense. So, you know, take that with a grain of salt. But I have watched, you know, when you're watching the 11 on 11 or when they're doing fastball, you're watching the whole thing, right? So another thing that stood out, for me, and I haven't noted, uh, Braxton. He's been the he's been the star of the secondary through camp, and this shouldn't shock anybody because Braxton looked really good last year as a true freshman. Uh, I have it noted here. Braxton has to be the star of the secondary so far. Two picks and at least a few other PBUs, pass breakups. He's been very active. 
his hands are up, his paws are out. You know, he's looking for the ball. He's jumping routes. He's looked the part. And I think, you know, this is someone who could get another, you know, another defender getting the all conference bid. You know, you talk about last year when you're talking about the uh, pass percentage, pass completion percentage. While that number, uh, that is, I knew it was bad. I didn't know it was that bad. They did jump from 125th or something in passing yards allowed all the way up to the top 40, which I do I do think says at least something. Now, it could also mean, yeah, a lot more teams are running the ball on them. You know, so that's why you're probably right and, and you are right about, you know, the pass completion percentage being something you need to be more concerned about. But that is an area where I think their secondary did take a pretty good leap forward in when you're talking about almost 100 spots up. And I don't think the run defense, I don't know, you probably have the numbers in front of you, I don't think it was better than what they did in 2022, but their run defense was not suspect early on in the year. In fact, their run defense was pretty sound at the beginning of the year outside of maybe giving up one or two uh, big plays per game. But outside of that, you know, the yards per carry numbers were pretty conservative, pretty good. So I do know later on in the year, though, the defense got it just they went kind of downhill. And that seems to be a reoccurring theme at Arkansas. They start off strong no matter who the defense coordinator is, and they end up kind of, you know, rough. But the run defense later on in the year did, I mean, it was really bad, you know, the last few games. But um, the secondary, you could see, you know, it felt like they were moving in the right direction. I knew their completion percentage or that stat that you talked about earlier. I knew that that was, there was going to be some areas where they might be rough in, but um, we did see them, you know, it seemed like they were more active, more willing to jump routes, more willing to, you know, it's, it's not like they got beat all the time compared to the years before when Odom was here, where it was like someone was always wide open. Uh, I remember Simeon Blair was someone in the secondary that was, oh my gosh. I mean, it was, they picked on him. They knew how easy it was to pick on the guy and they did it, but they, they did go into the portal. They grabbed a few guys, and one of them that has kind of, I think, could be competing and might be a starter, and there's actually a couple. Miguel Mitchell could end up playing the uh, the uh one of the safety spots, and Danico Slaughter, another guy. Uh, both those guys are transfers that, that will probably start, and maybe that'll help address some of those issues in the secondary. They still got a long ways to go. I know uh, uh, there's another one. Marquise Robinson's another corner that, that's probably going to be in the mix a little bit. Um, but yeah, there's a lot they need to fix. I don't know that they addressed all the issues. Um, I do like who they grabbed out of the secondary, out of the portal, but I still think there's a lot of work to do along the, uh, defensive line. A lot of work. Just to clarify on that passing statistic, that was a uh, pass efficiency. So that pass takes efficiency. all of it together. The yardage, the yardage per attempt, the TD yeah. pick ratio, the whole thing. It's a it's a TD. It's a passing efficiency rating, just like you rate the quarterbacks rating the the pass defense. So I see that um, they actually put a lot of attention toward building up the secondary. You mentioned through the transfer portal with mm. the two incoming guys, especially within the AC or the SEC with Tennessee and Florida transfers coming in, and then Robinson coming in as well. But uh, they signed six defensive backs in 2023 and five last year. And uh, as you mentioned, Jaden Johnson, Lorendo Johnson, you know, they've got experience coming back as well. Yep. The linebacker spot, no wonder there's concern here. I'm seeing transfers that left to go to Wisconsin, Arizona State, Ole Miss, UNLV. Their top two tacklers yeah. left. 92% <laughs> of their snaps at linebacker gone, yep. according to Pro Football Focus. And this Brad Spence, who you talked about, is the most quote-unquote experienced linebacker, and he didn't even play 100 snaps. Yep. Yeah, there's there's concern there. I know that you know they went out and they got the former five-star from Georgia, Xavion Sori Jr., who's uh, who I think has two years of eligibility. Uh, I, I do like him. I love his size. I, I like his athleticism, what little I've seen of him. But, I mean, outside of him, it's like you don't really have anyone that's seen, you know, or that's been around for a while, at least in the SEC. And even Sori didn't get a whole lot of attention at Georgia. So they – it is it is a big question mark. And like I said, I wouldn't argue with anybody who said – 
you know, maybe let's do three and three, three defensive linemen and three linebackers. I don't know what the talent pool is going to look like, you know, with this last uh, portal opening after spring camp. I don't know what the talent pool is going to look like, but they're going to have to grab. I, I really always have seen that the last several years as a, uh, I don't know the term, I don't want to say body snatcher, but <laughs> you're going out and you're just looking for depth at that point. I don't know how many great, stars you're going to get out, out of that i could be wrong maybe it's different this year i know they certainly grabbed some some really good players the last couple of years in that same portal cycle so um you know but the bulk of your when you're really doing it, it's that you know that time around december when that portal opens that's really when you're gaining your potential stars and what have you but linebacker is going to have to be a place they pay more attention to. It's either that or they're going to ride or die with these guys. I, again, I know they're focused on at least one to maybe two offensive linemen, uh, which they already did a lot of. You know, I mean, that whole offensive line, I mean, it's like everybody's a transfer at one point or another. Uh, I think I'm counting three potential starters are going to be transfers. And then you got Tykes Crawford maybe will make his way up there who's also a former transfer from charlotte a couple of years ago but on defense i think i felt i kind of thought they're going to do the same thing on the defensive line and they really they really haven't outside of uh Jun junkaj uh the defensive end they really haven't now the good news is they do have some young studs in that secondary selman bridges is someone i think he wears he's going to wear number two keep an eye on him and I think that's what his number is in practice, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, he's someone who I've heard other media guys who were down there watching the defense the whole time were just like, yeah, he may not be making the plays yet, but you could just you could see it. He's got a lot of potential. Uh, he was highly recruited out of high school, and he was, a, I think, a steal for Arkansas. So wouldn't be shocked if Selman Bridges makes his way into the two deep. He's going to be fighting off, uh, or he's going to be fighting – Excuse me, Jayheim Singletary, another former Georgia corner, and uh, maybe uh, Keon Stewart, who's another transfer from a year ago. That might be some of the names he's fighting to make his way into the 2D. But keep an eye on him, Jaden Allen, uh, of course, Jaden Johnson, the other safety. Him and Hudson Clark are both back this year. Uh, RJ Johnson, who's going to be a redshirt freshman, he's going to be another safety. They have faces back, but it's like, I think all these transfers are probably going to beat them out or all the, all the transfers in the secondary that I could tell the, you know, when you're talking about Danico slaughter, Miguel Mitchell, Marquise Robinson, those are all guys that are likely starters or at the very least too deep outside of maybe Jalen Braxton and uh, Lorando snacks Johnson. So, so many new, also TJ Metcalf is another guy they got back. They have two Metcalfs and uh, TJ also is one to, to uh, not ignore TJ Metcalf is, uh, someone who has, I think, has a lot of potential. So there's potential there. And you look at the new faces. We'll see what they do. I don't know if they're going to be better or worse in the secondary because, again, they lost Dwight McLaughlin. And, you know, and and they and you talk about the linebackers who also obviously help in, in pass coverage a little bit, especially around the middle of the field. We'll see how that works out. But, um, yeah, it, it had to be done. They had no other choice than to, to go pretty deep into the portal with the secondary. Again, I hope they do the same with the defensive line with what uh, scholarships they have left. And the linebackers, like I said, I'd be happy with three and three if they could do it, but not sure that's how it pans out. Jaden Johnson, Hudson Clark, uh, third and fifth in tackles last year. So for all the production that they miss at linebacker, at least they've got those defensive backs that have a ton of tackles and production there and people are going to be able to make it on over to Tusk talk with ty and see practice footage and and get uh up to the date uh daily reports semi-daily um lately what i've been doing is if you're a patreon supporter i've been uploading my raw reaction to what i've seen in practice those are always it may not be immediately after practice but it's sometimes it is um, sometimes things just happen, you know, um, but I, I, that's kind of a goal of mine to try and get that out to Patreon supporters first. And then in our discord, Patreon supporters are also going to get some of my notes that I'm seeing in, in, um, in practice and then try to do maybe one or two lives a week. Now that basketball season, well, it's been over for a while, but now that that's over, I'm probably going to cut it down to about two, maybe one or two lives a week and then 
try to cut those shows up and, and publish those out, uh, maybe in YouTube shorts or shorter videos, whatever. But yeah, I, um, I'm, um, it's this time of year where it's like, it's all spring camp. I don't have much of a baseball following, although the Razorback baseball team, again, unanimous number one, once again, I think that's maybe three weeks in a row, two or three weeks in a row where they've done that beating Auburn over the weekend, taking two out of three in their series down there. So I do a little bit of baseball, but it's right now I'm all in on spring camp and I'm covering as much as I can, getting it out to not just Patreon supporters, but to the, uh, to everyone else as well. So yeah, uh, don't really have dates right now on lives, like what time of day it's right now. It's just like when I'm able to sit down, compile all my notes and then just kind of put it all out there. But, um, it, 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 during the season, it's typically Monday, Wednesday, Friday, but that may change. I mean, you know how this, you know how this works, you know, sometimes it's just whenever you can go live is when you go live or when you publish content, it's when you publish content, but yeah, it'll pick up, especially starting this week with camp coming back. Ty, we always appreciate you stopping by, man. Good to see you. Yeah. Thanks for having me on Mark. As always, it's a blast.